Come on in. Come on in. Get excited, because it's going to get weird. Welcome, welcome, one and all. Just getting the framing right, and we will get started here in two seconds. That's probably fine. That's probably just fine. All right. Come on in. Come on in. Welcome to our, uh, our very, very, very long lesson on how literally everything happened. Uh, before I begin, I should point out that uh, I had a scheduled event for this live stream, and TikTok runs everything in uh, UTC, in a universal standardized time. Um, and I put the event in for 7 o'clock today when I'm you know, right now for now, and it said, okay, well, remember, we're in UTC, so that's going to be like 2 a.m. the next day. Not a big deal. 7 a.m. 7 p.m. is actually, you know, like uh, midnight UTC, so I set it for UTC time, and at midnight this morning, it ran the live stream and, and invited everybody, and nothing happened because I was in bed because it was midnight. So, like, no idea why it did that. So, so sorry if you signed up for that one. Uh, really freaking annoying. Uh, but, whatever. It, it, we're doing this at the time that I said we would. Uh, so, give me two seconds. I'm just going to run and grab one more charger to get the phone going here. Uh, so we don't die halfway through, and then we'll begin. So, this gives people time to filter in, and we'll get started in two seconds. Let me go grab an extension cord and a phone charger. I hope you guys are as stoked as I am, because we have got, oh, we've got a lot to get through. We've got a lot, a lot to get through. It's going to be a crazy, crazy time. I'll go and plug this in over here. Oop. Put that in there. Unplug this guy. Plug in that guy. All right. So, okay, huh. let's get started, because we got a lot to go. A um, couple of things before we jump in. Um, this is a live stream. It's, it's, I can't go through over and over and over and over and, and repeat things, so like if you come in late or if somebody comes in late and they don't know what's going on, I'm sorry. Uh, we'll try to get through it, uh, and TikTok is kind of weird about their recordings, uh, so if... I'm able to, I'll post this to my YouTube channel afterwards. If not, again, I'm very sorry. Uh, also, I'm very used to teaching in front of a class or in front of a crowd or in front of like a, a, a group or something. Um, and that matters because when that's happening, I can see your eyes. I can see how engaged you are. I can see who has questions and who's kind of looking at me like I'm not making any sense. And like, I can, I can act on that. I can read the crowd and make the lesson better. I can't do that now. So... If you're lost, uh, I will try to help, but I'm back here. It's going to be tricky for me to pop in all the time and see. I'm, I'm, not, I'm going to miss questions. Uh, I'm going to do my absolute best to make this as digestible and understandable as I possibly can, because this is important stuff that everybody needs to know. Um, one other thing, I have a projector back here, because some of these things are going to require a little bit more detail, so I'll be popping up some pictures for you, and it's really hot. It's blowing like crazy, so let me go grab a fan. Because my air conditioner is still broken and I'm already choking on hot air and we're not doing that. Oh goodness. Okay. Boom. Yes. Alright, that is going to save me tremendously. Okay, so like I said, uh, it's it's going to be a little bit different than usual uh, from, from all my other classes, but uh, I think it's going to work. I think we're going to get through this just fine uh, without too much damage. Um, one other thing, uh, actually no, that's not important, so I think we'll just jump right in. Well, let's get started. So today, first of all, hi, if you're new, my name's Forrest. Um, I'm an evolutionary biologist. I, I study life on this planet. Uh, Particularly, I study our history, I study humans, 
What's up, Baby Bear? Oh, if this is going on YouTube, I just want to remind you to thank your patrons and uh, invite them to go look at your new. Oh, I was going to do that at the end, but yeah, it's a good idea to put it in here at the top. Um, since this is going on YouTube, my, my fiance just pointed out as a, as a reminder, uh, thank you to my patrons on Patreon. And if, uh, if you'd like, if you go over to my YouTube after this, I have some really cool videos, like reacting to, to anti-evolution things that I think you'd enjoy. Um, so, the uh, uh, minus four, I'm a biologist, I study life, I study humans, um, and as a part of becoming a biologist, as a part of learning about these things, I studied a lot of astronomy and a lot of physics and a lot of chemistry because I have the same questions that you and everybody else does. I want to understand where all this stuff came from, how it works, why it's here, why it does what it does, you know, because seeing the universe around us raises some questions, like, what the fuck is any of this? So, like, that's what I'm here for. That's what I'm, what, what I'm, what I'm trying to explain to you guys today. We're going to cover a brief history of absolutely everything. We're going to talk about the Big Bang. We're going to talk about where planets and stars come from. We're going to talk about how evolution works. We're going to talk about the history of life on this planet. Um, I am going to summarize things very, very much. Uh... But I'll try to, you know, stop every now and then, and like at the at the end of each section, just kind of check to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, uh, let's see here. What else? What else? What else? Oh, and uh, I I have uh, my fiance here is is moderating. Um, I am super down with questions. I'll try to answer as many of them as I can. Uh, if you're just here to push your religion, though, I didn't come to your church to teach science, so please kindly take your religion out of my science classroom. It's just not necessary. Uh, we're, we are here to ask questions and to learn about the universe, and that's what I'm here to do. So, with that, uh, we're going to go and jump in by explaining um, how any of this works, how science works, and how we know uh, what we're doing, and uh, how we know what we know. This is very strange, to, uh, talking about these things without having an audience. It's so very, it's very, it's so very, very different. Um, the first thing we need to know is how science works in the first place. Because a lot of the times when we talk about the Big Bang Theory, when we talk about theory of evolution, when we talk about any of these other things, people say, oh, it's just a theory. And how you don't know, you weren't there, you don't know anything about it, you know, all these different things. Um, let me show you something, okay? Here's a puzzle, okay? Very easy little puzzle here for children's, okay? And we have here all these aliens, all these little pieces of different shapes and different colors and different eyes and all these things. But this one's missing, okay? So here's the question. What does this piece look like? Well, there's no way for you to know, right? You don't see the piece. You can't go find the piece. You didn't meet the guy who made the puzzle. You have no idea. But we can ask some questions and we can study the rest of the puzzle in order to understand what the piece looks like, okay? So we can see that each of these shapes fits perfectly into the little hole that it sits in. So we can assume that this piece is probably rectangular because it would fit into that shape. Is that a guarantee? Could it be two circles and there's a bunch of empty space? Yeah, absolutely could be. Does that fall in line with the rest of the evidence though? No. So it's possible, but very, very unlikely. Uh, also, we notice that it says the name of the shape, hexagon, oval, triangle. Here it says rectangle. That's more evidence for what's going on there. Is it possible that it's actually two triangles that are cut diagonally and that's how they fit in there together and that would make it fit the shape and it would make a rectangle so like that work? Yeah, that, that could be the case, but there's no evidence for that, so we, we don't know. What color is the piece? How could you possibly know the color of the piece without seeing the piece? Well, we look at all the other pieces and they have little extensions that are the same color as the piece itself, so this has some blue extensions. We can assume that this is probably blue. Is it possible that it's a rainbow and it's got a picture of a ham sandwich on it? Yeah, that's possible, maybe. But all the other ones just have eyes and faces and all the other ones match their colors. So, like, we can assume that it's blue and has a picture of a face on it. So, like, here we're still, like, this is how science works. We're studying other things in order to gain information on something that we couldn't possibly know otherwise. There's no way. Were you there when the puzzle was made? Did you meet the guy who made the puzzle? You've never seen the piece yourself. How could you possibly know what this piece is? It's because we can study the rest of the puzzle. We can study the rest of the board. We can study the other pieces. We can understand what's going on here without ever looking at it. Okay, and that's how science works in the grand scheme of things. Were we there at the Big Bang? 
Did we watch evolution happening? Did we meet some creator deity? Did we see anything about... No, of course not. We, we haven't lived billions of years. But we can look at the Earth. We can look at the fossils. We can look at the atoms, that the chemistry is what's going on. We can look out in space. We can see the radiation. We can see the motion of the planets. We can look at the other pieces of the puzzle and make new knowledge where there wasn't knowledge before. We can understand what's going on out in the universe without ever having to directly see it. And that brings me to the idea of what a theory is. Okay? A theory is a functional model for what's going on in the universe. Okay? It's a way of explaining what we see. And when you hear about the Big Bang Theory or the theory of evolution, and people say, oh, well, it's just a theory, that means it's a guess. Remember, the word theory means something very different in science. Okay? In science, a theory isn't a guess. If I tell you I have a theory about why my car doesn't start, I have a theory about where my socks go in the dryer, I have a theory about how frogs control the weather, right? That's, those are just guesses. Those are like, I think I might, I may have some knowledge on this, I may not. Either way, this is just what I'm thinking at the time. In science, theory is the highest level to which we can possibly elevate an idea, okay? Uh, the theory of evolution, the theory of the Big Bang are on the same level as the theory of gravity, the theory that your body is made of cells, the theory that germs make you sick, the theory of plate tectonics, the theory that the Earth goes around the sun, the theory that the Earth is round. Those are all theories. So when you hear this word theory, try not to let it stick in your mind too much. It's like, oh, well, this just means nothing. No, actually, what the word theory means is that all the best evidence we have is pointing in this one direction. All the best evidence we have. And there's absolutely nothing conflicting with it. Because if we have contrary evidence, if we have evidence that, that contradicts our theory, then we either need to change the theory to make it fit that evidence, or we throw the, th uh, the theory out and we start from scratch. Okay? Cole Takes would like to know, yeah. what is the formal difference between a theory versus a hypothesis? Phenomenal question. It really just comes down to testing and evidence. So when you have the scientific method, you start with an observation. This is often misunderstood. People say, oh, well, you haven't observed evolution, so it's not scientific. That's not what observation means. Observation is, I see that there is life. How did that happen? So you start with a, an observation, something that makes you ask a question. Then you form a hypothesis, which is, I'm pretty sure this would work. I'm pretty sure this would help explain it. You run experiments to rule out as many hypotheses as possible. And when you can no longer prove something wrong, that's when you're able to start moving towards a theory. So this is a big misunderstanding about science. We don't prove anything. We're never proving a hypothesis. We fail to reject a hypothesis. That's how it works. We don't prove things. We can no longer prove that this doesn't exist. That's what scientists do. We try to prove ourselves wrong every single day. And when we can't do that, then that's what we stick with is this is probably the truth. Because remember, think about a map, right? A map of the Earth. If you had no map at all, you'd be pretty lost. If you had a map from the 1500s, that'd be pretty wrong, but it would be better than having no map at all in a lot of cases. Compare that to a Google Images, a Google satellite map today. Way, way, way better way more accurate, but still wrong, because things are changing on the Earth all the time. Plate tectonics are always happening. People are moving things around. So the Earth is what the Earth looks like. Every single map is wrong, but some of them are useful. And that's exactly how it is with science. Every single theory, every single model is wrong. It's got some pieces missing, but some of them are functional. Some of them really do a good job of explaining things. And all we're doing is trying to make these theories better, trying to understand them a little bit better. So just like with this, whatever you think that puzzle piece looks like, you're wrong a little bit, probably. There's a slim chance that you have it exactly perfectly right. But you're probably a little bit wrong. But you're better off than somebody who says, I can never, ever possibly know what this looks like because I wasn't there, I never knew, you know, I never met the guy, I never did that, blah, 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 blah. Right? So... This is how science works. We are taking the evidence that we have and understanding the universe around us. That's the first thing that everybody needs to know is we're not just making this shit up. We are not just guessing. We are not just coming up with this off the top of our heads. Um, 
this is something that we actually build with evidence and understanding. Uh, it's not just a guess. It's not just a, somebody said something. It's not dogmatic. It's not religious. It's none of that stuff. Um, so now, we're going to get into the actual questions here, to the actual start of it. Before I move on, does anybody have questions about what science is, how science works, what a theory is? Before we move on from here, just really quick, do we have any good questions about that before we jump into how the Big Bang happened? I see to the email. Do you see anything special? It's just now getting to where you asked. Mm. Okay. We are on like a 10 second delay from what I say to you hearing it to it getting back to me. So I have to remember. <laughs> Science is not a body of knowledge. Science is not a book with all the answers. Science is a process. Science is a way in which we can understand more about the universe around us. It's a way of thinking and a way of asking questions and testing those questions in order to get a better understanding of reality. Just like what I just talked about with maps, right? The earth is what the earth looks like. Every map is wrong. Some of them are useful. Reality is what reality is. Science is our way of drawing a map of reality, if that makes sense. Yeah, so, I mean, there are a few questions, but none of them specifically about what a theory or a hypothesis. Jamming. Right. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and move on then, and we're going to jump into the Big Bang, how the Big Bang happens, what the Big Bang actually means. So, in the original video that I was reacting to with this stuff, somebody, the guy was talking about how the Big Bang was an explosion in space that made the Earth. And... Everything that he talked about the Big Bang sounded like the straw man that somebody gave him of like, so scientists think these crazy things, right? So here's what the Big Bang actually is. First of all, it's important to note the, the, the phrase Big Bang freaking sucks. I hate the name the Big Bang because it was actually come up with by a, a Baptist pastor, if I remember correctly, um, who was making fun of the idea. Um, he was a physicist. He just thought that the thing was absurd, and that's how he called it. Um, but... Uh, Big Bang is a gross oversimplification of what actually happened and how it actually works. It's just a popular way of saying things. The Big Bang was not an explosion. The Big Bang was not, you know, out of nothing, everything sprang. None of this is how this actually works. The Big Bang was the beginning of space and time. I much prefer the word everywhere stretch, which I believe minute physics is the one that I first heard say that. Big Bang sucks. The everywhere stretch is a much better way to say this. Because what we're talking about is literally the entire universe. Every single, ev all of it, stretching and expanding. That's what the Big Bang is. It's the everywhere stretch. Everything in the universe expanding. And we noticed this originally back in the early 1900s, mid-1900s, um, when this guy named Hubble, great astrophysicist, was staring off at some telescopes, looking at all of these galaxies moving around, and he noticed that all the galaxies in the universe, most of them anyway, were moving away from each other. They're all moving away. And he thought, if they're all moving away from each other, then it kind of stands to reason that at a certain point, they were all very close together, if not right on top of each other. So this is where we start to get this idea. Um, we look out in the universe and we, we start thinking, okay, if all this was really crammed together, if all of space, all the whole universe was all squished together very, very tightly, well, we know because of you know basic laws of physics that that would make it really, really hot and really, really dense. There would be a lot of light, a lot of heat, a lot of radiation from that that would completely cover the whole universe. We should be able to see that. We look out in the universe and what do we find? The cosmic microwave background radiation is exactly that. We see this low-level light radiation that is absolutely uniformly everywhere across the whole universe. The only way that would be possible is if the entire universe was very, very, very hot at one point, a long time ago, and now that heat is dissipating out, and this is what we see, is this electromagnetic radiation left over. Um, so this is great evidence, is the, the cosmic microwave background radiation. You can look it up if you like. That was actually discovered by some guys at uh, Bell Telephone. They were had this giant radio telescope 
listening to the universe and they noticed that there was this noise no matter where they listened and they studied it more and found out that that's what this is. This is cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, so we see a lot of evidence for this Big Bang. This is just a couple of them. I'm not going to get super duper into detail. Um, but we see a lot of different evidences for this and it shows us that at one point, about you know, 13.8 billion years ago, every single thing in the universe was squished together. Space itself was squished together. Now here are the big questions. If space is expanding, if the universe is getting bigger, what's it expanding into? If the universe is all that it is, what's it expanding into? No clue. What was there before the universe that caused this expansion? Well, we're talking about the beginning of time. You're asking me what happened before time started. What happened before the phrase before meant anything? No idea. And here's the most important lesson about this, is that it's okay to say, I don't know. We don't know what caused the Big Bang, if anything. How did something come from nothing? What's nothing? I've never seen a nothing. We don't have a nothing to run tests on. Here in my hand is nothing. That's not true. There's empty space here. There's light here. There's, there's air here. There's a magnetic field here. There's all sorts of things here. There's no such thing as nothing. We have no idea what nothing is, so we can't test it, so we have no, we don't know. And it's okay to say we don't know. It's not okay to be okay with not knowing. I want to know so bad it keeps me up at night. But I don't know, and nobody else does either. And so right now, all we can say is, this is the evidence we have, this is what we know happened. We don't know why, we don't know how, we don't know what first, we don't know if before that makes any sense. It just, it, it's crazy. So, it's okay to say I don't know. You're going to learn that a lot as we go through science. There's things that do make sense and things that don't. And the things that don't, we try to poke at and prod at until they do. Um, with the Big Bang, we know for sure it happened. We have plenty of evidence for it. We know it wasn't just an explosion in space that pooped out the Earth. That didn't work. It was literally the beginning of space and time itself. We know it happened. We know it made sense. Uh... We don't know what was before it, or if before it even is a possibility. So that's where we're, where the best the best people in science are working. We got top men, top men and women working on it right now. But as for this moment, we have no idea. So here you've got the Big Bang, the beginning of all space and time. Within a few fractions of a second, the universe goes from a tiny, tiny, infinitesimally small point. Uh, uh, everything in space, every single bit of matter, every single bit of energy is just compressed into something smaller than the size of an atom, just absolutely tiny, and it starts to expand and grow. Just starts to grow. Everything stretches. Everywhere stretches. This is the Big Bang, quote, quote. Everything stretches, right? So this thing starts to stretch out, and as it does, it cools down because there's more space. Remember how physics works. If you have something that's really hot and dense, and it stretches out and relaxes, it starts to cool down and, and, and get just easy. Because E equals MC squared, matter and energy are, are inversely proportional. Um, because, you know, uh, 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 energy is just consolidated, or matter is just consolidated energy, uh, as these things cool down, the very first particles start to form together. As the very first particles start to form together, we now have new laws of electrodynamics, of electric uh, uh, electricity and, and of, of uh, uh, electrical charges bonding. So like protons having a positive charge and electrons having a negative charge start to kind of figure out that they want to be around each other. And the very, very first element in the whole universe is born, and that element is hydrogen. Because hydrogen has, let me see if I've got a nice red here. I'm going to set these out so it's easier for me to grab. Because hydrogen has absolutely just one proton. Make that bigger. You can see it. There we go. One proton and one electron. And that one electron orbits it like this, and that's hydrogen. That's it. One positive charge, one negative charge. Hydrogen. Boom. Done. Easy squeezy. This is the very first element in the whole universe. Why is it the first? Well, it's the easiest one. And because we need something to make more of them. Okay? There may have also been some helium. Some, some sort of put it that way. Helium is... Uh, 
two protons. two electrons, and two neutrons. Some sources indicate this way. So we have very, very, very simple elements, right? Very, very, very simple. Where do we get all the other ones, right? Because why didn't the Big Bang make uranium, right? Why, why isn't there iron coming out of the Big Bang? What's that all about? Very, very easy, okay? We need something in this universe to make bigger elements. There are two places in the entire universe where you can make bigger elements. Two places, okay? Number one is really, really expensive nuclear laboratories with great big particle accelerators that can smash atoms together and get them to fuse. Those did not exist at the time of the Big Bang, right? The other place that we can get new elements is from stars. Stars make new elements. And they do this by way of stellar nucleosynthesis. And we're gonna talk about that in two seconds. First, we're gonna take a 30 second break and make sure, does anybody have any questions about the Big Bang, about what we do or don't know about it, or why the word Big Bang doesn't make any sense and it really should be everywhere stretch, in my opinion. But Big Bang is popular, it makes sense. So really quick, do we have any, any good questions about just that thing, just what we're talking about there? Ethan wants to know, Yep. do you think the Big Bang could have been the universe imploding on itself and restarting? Could the Big Bang be a restart with the universe imploding on itself? Amazing question. Um, probably not, and here's why. When we look at, this is going to be kind of a complicated answer, but I'm going to make it simple at the end. When we look at the universe, there's different possibilities of how the universe could be shaped and what kind of energy uh, uh, we'd we'll be talking about here. Um, we could have an open universe where the universe just keeps on expanding forever and ever and ever, faster and faster and faster. We could have a closed universe with a set dead amount of energy and it expands to a certain point, runs out of expansive energy, collapses down, and we have a second Big Bang like what you're talking about. But it seems like the evidence is that we have what's called a flat universe. And in a flat universe, we have a certain amount of expansive energy, we have a certain amount of negative energy, like gravity and whatnot, and those balance out to exactly zero. All the energy in the universe, net, net total, is nil. So we have, this is the most mathematically beautiful universe, as Lawrence Krauss says. Um, so in a flat universe, we'll keep expanding forever and ever and ever until we hit what we call the heat death, and at that point, there's just no more energy anymore. Everything is frozen, everything dies, and the universe just decays into nothingness. That's where we're going. That's what it seems is gonna happen to our universe. Uh, there is not evidence to suggest that we will ever have a big crunch, as it's called, and then <laughs> re-expand. Um, there's just, there would have to be mathematical evidence behind that, and there just isn't. Not saying it's impossible, again, remember what we said about, about with theories and things, it's not impossible, but all the best evidence that we have suggests that that's just not the case. A really, really good question. You're not the only person to think that. A lot of great scientists have thought that before. And we tested it out mathematically, and it does not seem like that's what's going to happen. Uh, not a question, but Ronald wants you to know that it's all God. Don't even try to wrap your head around any of it. And that right there is a huge freaking problem. Because what you're saying is, don't try to understand something. I refuse. I refuse to just not try to understand something. Um, it is human nature to understand things and to figure things out and to poke and to prod and to learn. That is what science is all about. And if we had that mindset of just don't try to understand anything, we would not have airplanes, we would not have air conditioning, we would not have cars, we would not have vaccines, we would not have aspirin, we would not have uh, 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 C-sections, we would not have uh, any clean food and drinking water. It would be nothing. We would have people dying from drinking diseased, shitty water that they've been all crapping in, and we would say, ah, God wanted them to die. What can we do? Water filtration? That's the devil. Fuck that. You know? No, we're not doing that. We are absolutely going to continue asking questions. We are absolutely going to continue to learn about this universe. And what's funny is, the more we do that, the less and less we need this hypothesis of a creator. Uh, that's the best thing about science, is that there was a time back when Napoleon was in power, he asked this guy named Laplace, who was a great physicist, um, 
you know, give me a model of the whole universe. And Laplace did. He wrote out a whole model and uh, of, of everything they knew at the time. And Napoleon said, I noticed you haven't put God in here. And Laplace famously said, my lord, it works just fine without that assumption. And that's what we find about the universe, is that when we didn't know what lightning was, that was the gods. It was Zeus. It was Thor. It was, it was you know, Wotan. It was all these things making lightning happen. Actually, no, it's just electron gradients. Figured it out. Okay, yeah. Well, but what makes the electrons happen? That's, that's got... Actually, no, it's just, it's just, you know, really simple. The atoms are rubbing together and you create ions. It's, it's really not that crazy. Okay, but something's doing this other thing, isn't it? And this God hypothesis just becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So, uh, with that, we're going to move on from that. Again, I'm going to say it again, just like we did at the beginning. I am here to teach you the things that you ask questions about. Uh, I did not come to your church to teach science. So please keep your religion the fuck out of my science classroom. Anything else about it before we move on? Uh, Jesus would like to know, is there any popular hypotheses for what happened before the Big Bang? Any popular hypotheses about what happened before the Big Bang? No. Um, like I said before, you're asking me what happened before time started. What happened before the phrase before meant anything. So... There is no hypothesis here. We have no idea. There are certain philosophical ideas about, like, maybe there was a prime mover of some kind. Maybe there was something that started something. But then that's something that exists outside of space and time. So what the fuck does that even mean? That makes no sense. Uh, there are some ideas about uh, how the, the, the uh, concept of nothingness is unstable and doesn't really work. That's something physicists actually talk about. Radical, but like I said before, we, we've never seen nothing. We have no idea what nothing is or what it looks like or what it does. So, like, we, we can't test that. We can't know for sure. So, just, there's no ideas on what happened before the Big Bang because the phrase, what happened before the Big Bang, literally makes no sense. What happened before time started? No idea. Okay, and just two more things before we move forward. Yeah. Uh, first thing, if you're going to be writing things on the board, Moto Moto Hugs wants to make sure you use the inverted filters. So they can read what you're writing. Well, I won't write any words up here, but if I do, I'll make sure to flip it. Yes. And lastly, um, I just wanted to point out before we go through this, I don't know is an okay and acceptable answer. Yeah, I'm going to repeat that just in case you can't hear her because she's just on the other side of this thing here. But uh, I, we talked about it at the beginning. If you missed it, we'll repeat it. I don't know is okay. It's okay to say you don't know something. It's not okay to say, I don't know, therefore it must be magic. That's not okay. You, you don't get to do that. And you certainly don't get to say, you can't prove it wasn't magic, therefore it was. That's not, that's how crazy people talk. That's not logic. Like, it, it doesn't work. I have a goblin living in this closet right over here, uh, and he's interdimensional, and if you look in the closet, he'll disappear. His name's Roland. He likes Subway sandwiches. Can you prove this is not true? Can you prove that Roland the Closet Goblin doesn't exist? No, you cannot. Does that mean that he's real? No, it does not. So, we don't get to say, just because it can't be proven wrong, that means it's right. And we don't get to say, just because we don't know it's magic. Okay? That's not allowed. Those are against the rules of logic. Okay? Don't break the rules. So, we're going to get back into it. The next part, we talked about the Big Bang. We're now going to move on to where new atoms come from. Because remember where we left off? We talked about how there was hydrogen, and only hydrogen, maybe helium, but these very, very, very small elements. How did we move on from there? How did we get all the rest of these elements? Well, this is something that we can actually watch happening today. We can literally look at this happening today. It all happens because of what we call stellar nucleosynthesis, okay? So, the first thing we need is a star. Fortunately, we have this shit called gravity, right? Gravity works when you have a mass, something uh, uh, with mass, with weight, and more and more mass starts to accumulate on it, more and more stuff starts to pile towards the center. Gravity always pulls towards the center of mass. That's why this is down and this is up. Up means away from the center of the Earth. Down means towards the center of the Earth. If you're out in space, up and down don't mean anything except for what direction is the closest mass of object, right? So, we have a small cluster of hydrogen, maybe, something to little thing, more hydrogen starts to accumulate, more hydrogen starts to accumulate, you end up with a giant ball of hydrogen gas that is millions of times bigger than the planet that we're talking on right now. Okay? Big ball of hydrogen gas. When more and more of this stuff starts to accumulate together and starts to squish together, you get more and more pressure 
in the center. The weight of all of these things, because what is weight, right? We have mass. Mass interacting with gravity is what we call weight. My body weighs about 175 pounds. What does that mean? It means that all the atoms in my body being pressed down on the Earth by the force of gravity, about 9.81 meters per second squared, that comes out to what we would call 175 pounds. So as you have all this hydrogen, the super light gas, crushing into the center of the star, you now have in the center of the star the weight of all this gas pressing down on you. It is trillions and billions and insane amounts of pounds of pressure. And with all this pressure comes heat because we have this thing called the kinetic molecular theory, which says that every single atom and molecule is constantly wiggling and jiggling around. And as they're wiggling and jiggling, they're squished in and cramped together. They're bumping against each other, creating friction, creating heat. As this happens, right, more and more and more pressure and heat, we hit a critical moment where there's so much heat and so much pressure that these atoms start to smack together and they don't come apart anymore. They fuse into a totally new thing. Okay? This is what we call nucleosynthesis. And it's a little bit more complex than the way that I just phrased it. I am simplifying a little bit. If we take a look here, this is called the proton proton chain. And this is how she actually works. Okay? So you have one proton, one neutron fused together here, one proton, one neutron fused together here. You have these two deuterium atoms here with one proton, one They smack together. You end up with a helium nucleus and one neutron popping off, or you just get a, a, a proper helium nucleus. Here, these guys coming off here is uh, electromagnetic radiation, what we call light. Okay? This is called the proton-proton chain. This is how hydrogen fuses into helium inside a star. Okay? Now, what we're talking about here is just the very basics, right? The very, very, very basics. Hydrogen fusing into helium. When this happens, when these two elements fuse together, they produce a huge amount of heat and light. And that is what we call sunshine. The stars shining all around you is the result of atoms fusing together to make heavier elements. Okay? And let me flip the camera around for a second. Uh, mirror the video there. Because I want to show you this. The more we fuse things, the heavier and heavier elements we get. So here's hydrogen turning into helium here. Then, this is the outer layer here. As we go deeper, we get nitrogen. We get carbon and neon. We get oxygen, right? We go in more, we get magnesium. We go in more, we get silicon and sulfur. We get in more, we get nickel. And then fire, uh, finally, iron. Why is iron important? We're going to talk about it. Okay? Let me turn that back on there. Why is iron important? It's because there is a constant back and forth, constant battle going on inside this star. Okay? Constant balance. Everything in the universe is all about balance. You've got this super duper hot core, a fusion core in the very center of the star where this nuclear fusion is happening. The nuclear fusion pushing out, exploding, literally the star is exploding constantly. Why is it not blowing apart? Because it's so fucking big that gravity is pushing back on it. So you've got gravity pushing in, crushing the star. You've got the explosive force of the nuclear fusion pushing out. And there's this balance here in the core. If this fusion reaction gets out of control, it's going to expand, which is going to allow it to cool down, which means it's going to come back into control under gravity. If it starts to not work anymore, if the star starts to fizzle out, gravity's gonna win. It's gonna crush the star, which is gonna compress and heat up that core even further, which is gonna speed up the reaction, and so it's gonna expand to get and balance out. You've got this perfect balance of outward and inward, from the explosive force to gravity, constantly pushing on this star in all directions. Until we fuse iron. Because when we fuse iron, the net force, the explosive force, and the force pushing in is nil. When we fuse iron, the reaction doesn't produce energy anymore enough to push the star out. Okay? It doesn't make enough energy. So gravity wins. Gravity crushes the star. It's no longer making enough energy to push itself out. So gravity crushes the star like that. And what happens then, remember I just said, that makes a lot of reactions happen. We send this fusion reaction into flip-flapping overdrive. 
and it goes absolutely haywire, out of control, and blows that star to fucking smithereens in what we call a supernova, this is the best fireworks in the universe. This is a supernova. This is the leftovers of a supernova. Kablooey! Just fun fact, this is called the Crab Nebula. It is my favorite thing in the night sky. Um, this is called, uh, the, the technical term is SN 1054, which stands for Supernova 1054. We call it that because this was actually visible from Earth in the year 1054. We have uh, astronomers and writers from China and the Middle East who write about how one day, one star in the night sky got insanely bright. It was so bright that we could, they could read at nighttime by the light of this, this super duper bright star, and that was visible for literally weeks. And the star in the night sky, the, the bright, it, 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 it wasn't visible uh, um, at daytime anymore after a couple of weeks. That's another thing, you could see it during the day as well. Um, after a couple of weeks, it wasn't visible during the day anymore, but you could still see the brightness at nighttime for about two years. So this is an explosion that is so goddamn bright that you could literally see it during the daytime and you could read at nighttime by the light of this star. This thing here is about five and a half light years in diameter. You could fit our entire solar system from here to here about 6,000 times. This thing is huge. It's called the Crab Nebula or SN1054. This is the leftovers of a supernova. These are all of the elements that were made in the core of that star. In that explosion, we make so many more elements. In fact, here's our periodic table, okay? We have 118 elements here. Here's hydrogen, where we started, right here. Here's helium, the next element to be made. We make all these elements up to right here, carbon. This is where the star explodes, and in that flash, in that instant that the star explodes, we make all the rest of these elements all the way up to plutonium. In fact, you can rewrite this periodic table like this to show where these elements come from. These two blue ones, these are the Big Bang, right here. These are cosmic rays, just particles interacting with each other, right? All these yellow ones here are small stars. All the green is large stars. The red ones are only made in supernovae. These purple ones down here are man-made, so ignore those. You pointed at iron and said carbon. Did I? Yeah, you pointed at FE and said all the way to here, carbon. Oh, I must not have been paying attention. I'm sorry. This is iron. I, just, I wasn't, wasn't thinking. Um, carbon's up here. I just completely misspoke. I apologize. Thank you for catching that. So all these red ones here, these, these red is only made in a supernova. Think about this for a second, okay? Think about this. You see here, oh, well, actually, let me put this back for a second. See how we've got this AU is gold, AG here is silver, okay? Raise your hand in class if you are wearing gold or silver jewelry at this moment. I am. Here's my, my engagement ring. Will someday be my wedding ring. This is made of sterling silver. These atoms are only made in a supernova. The atoms that made this ring came from an exploding star. That's the only place where we can get them. And they're right here on my finger. Another thing that you should know. Actually, you know what? We're going to get there in a little bit. So let me come back to that for just a minute. So these here, these atoms come from exploding stars. Mm -hmm. That blows my goddamn mind every day that I think about it. We've got all these different elements here, like... Iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc, aluminum, silicon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. We have all these other really important elements here. What's going to happen to them, right? Well, here we've got this supernova with all these different pieces, all these different elements floating around in it, right? All these different elements are floating out here. This is a nursery right here. This is a nursery where new stars and other things can be formed. So you start with a small amount of some hydrogen, some leftover, flowing together, making a new star. 
So a new star is born right here. All this dust around the outside. Why does it make a perfect little disc like that? It's because if you take things that are just randomly moving all over the place, which they would be in a supernova, they're just all over, um, they cancel each other out. They collide with each other, they bump into each other, and they start to cancel out until everything's just moving in one direction. Doesn't necessarily have to be a flat disk. It can be a flat disk this way, a flat disk this way, whatever. We're only looking at an orbital plane, and assuming that means flat doesn't mean shit. It just means that that's the direction in which everything cancels each other out, okay? So, we get this, we call this an accretion disk. From these clouds of dust, just like how the stars formed, we start to get rocks forming. Things just start to clump together into asteroids, okay? So we get these asteroids clumping together. These asteroids clump together to form what we call planetesimals, or chunks of planets, little pieces, right? Like this guy here, this little almost kind of fledgling moon hanging out there. These things clump together further, and if they get big enough to clear out all the dust in their orbit, we then call them a planet. This is where solar systems come from, from the dust left over from exploding stars. Just the dust left over, so fucking much of it that we're able to build whole planets out of it. And sometimes you're lucky enough to get a planet like this one, which has water. Where did the water come from? I'm so glad you asked. There's a couple of hypotheses here. The first one is that we have things called carbonaceous chondrites, which we can see out in the universe today. We have these asteroids and comets that are full of water that just <clears throat> pop into this guy, give us some water. Also, could have just been from the accretion disk. Who knows? There's actually two major models for uh, uh, how the solar system formed. You can read about both of them if you want to go online and pull up this right here. Let me grab from my bookshelf. Ugh. This is called the Astrobiology Primer 2.0. It's for free online. It's from NASA, and they go over how solar systems form. Once again, I am skipping over a lot of details because we've already been doing this for almost an hour, and we're not even halfway done. So just I'm skipping over some details, but long story short, we have stuff from space. We have water in space. We can find it. Some of that crash lands on your planet. Also, we have an atmosphere. Atmospheres are held on by two things. First is just gravity. We have you know the gas held on by gravity, but that's not a lot enough because... The sun is still going through its own nuclear fusion, pushing out what we call solar winds. The solar winds are charged particles and radiation that are blasting everything in their path, destroying everything around them. Fortunately, our Earth is made mainly of iron and nickel. The core of our planet is made of iron and nickel, and that's important because those are magnetic elements. Iron, nickel, and cobalt are the only three elements which are magnetic all by themselves. So we have iron and nickel making the core of this planet because it's molten and hot and moving around. We get this magnetic field. We call this a magnetosphere. And this magnetosphere is what protects us from solar winds, from all this crazy ionizing radiation blasting off the sun. Fun fact for you, where we have a perpendicular line with this top of this magnetic field hitting where the sun solar winds are hitting, that's where we get the aurora borealis and the aurora australis. The northern and southern lights are the interaction between the sun solar winds and the Earth's magnetic field. What would it be like if we could take that science of combining a magnetic field and plasma, supercharged plasma, and we could interact those two things to make colors and lights the way that we want them? We can do that. It's called a plasma screen TV. That's how they fucking work. How great is that? Mm -hmm. Let me turn this off and get my phone buzzing here. And I don't want you to have to hear about it. There we go. Okay, so we talked about this is where planets come from now. We've covered that. We're about to get into the next big section. So really quick, once again, does anybody have any big questions about where planets come from, how stars are formed, how stars make new atoms, um, uh, anything like that? Before we move on, we'll take a quick 30-second break. Does anybody have any questions about stars or the formation of planets before we get into my favorite part coming up next? Uh, there were some questions about the first picture you put up there. I don't know if you misspoke or what. Which one? But, uh, people are asking, is that a nucleus? Is this a cell? Uh, don't you mean the sun? You showed which? like the different layers. Which, which, the different layers of the star? We're talking about... Yes. 
Well, this one? Yeah, I, you might have misspoke on this one. Okay, so th this is a star that we're talking about here. This is a star, and we're showing different layers from the fusion reaction, pushing out different uh, 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 atoms, different atoms, different elements, okay? So this is a star, this is not a cell, and this is the fusion core where we're making the heavier and heavier and heavier elements, and those elements are out in layers here. You don't really have to worry about the layers, just know that these are the elements that are being made, usually in this order, inside these stars. Another thing that I should point out also is that this supernova is only going to happen in supermassive, gigantic stars. Stars like ours that are a little bit smaller aren't going to go supernova. They're actually going to fizzle out around the carbon stage. Um, so you're going to have a giant ball of super hot, super dense carbon. Um, that'll happen around 4 billion years from now for our sun. When it does, the star won't be stable anymore. So the corona, which is the outermost layer of the star, the fireball around the outside of the star, will expand, vaporize, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, <clears throat> gone, um, and the star will die being just a giant ball of super hot, super dense carbon, which, by the way, what happens when you have carbon and you get a super hot, super dense? That's called a diamond. So we would end up with a diamond about the size of the planet Earth right there where the star was. How beautiful is that? Isn't that a nice thing to think about? Sheep, Terrifying. Sheep chicken wants to know. Yeah. How was the dust formed in the first place before being a planet? So again, here we have this star making all these elements. When it makes iron, it goes supernova, and it makes all the other elements on the periodic table down to plutonium. This is the dust, okay? We're talking about atoms here. We're talking about just individual atoms being created from this star. So this star took hydrogen, made all these other elements, and then fucking exploded, and that is the dust that makes planets. Iron and nickel are what makes the core of our Earth. Here they are made in large stars and supernova, right here, right? Here's uh, the oxygen, which makes up a lot of our atmosphere, the nitrogen makes a lot of our atmosphere, made in large and small stars, even ones that don't go supernova, okay? So here's, this is where the dust comes from. It comes from stars. And as the stars explode, they spread out their delicious innards all across the, atmosphere, all across the, the, the cosmos, and those delicious star guts are what makes things like planets. Star Me Up wants to know, mm -hmm. how do we know that background radiation is not just faraway stars? Uh, because it is completely uniform, and it's not coming in a direction like it's coming out of a star. It's just everywhere in all directions all the time. So if it were coming from stars, it would look completely different. Really, really good question. Um, you just showed that helium was one of the most abundant elements. Yep. Why are there rumors that Earth's helium is going away? It's because helium is super light, and it's not going to be held down by gravity. So the only way that we get helium now is from uranium deposits right here. So let me cover this back up. You have the center of an atom here. All these protons hanging out. All these neutrons hanging out. All these electrons around the outside, right? This can go through several different kinds of decay. It can break down in several different ways. One of them is called alpha decay. And in alpha decay, out from here, comes two protons and two neutrons stuck together. We call this an alpha particle. That is the nucleus of a helium atom that comes out of there. Okay? So if we look at, let me erase this. If we look at the periodic table, okay, here we've got uranium down here. Uranium goes through alpha decay, it loses two protons, it becomes thorium. Because remember, the definition of what an element is, is how many protons it has. Okay? Take carbon here, right? Carbon has six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons. If I take one proton off of it, it is not super light carbon, it is boron, it's going to behave like boron. If I add a proton to it, it is not heavy carbon. It is nitrogen. It's going to behave like nitrogen. It is nitrogen. I can change the number of neutrons. I can change the number of electrons. No big deal. Change the number of neutrons, we call that an isotope. Change the number of electrons, we call that an ion. Change the number of protons, it is a different element. Okay? So 
This here, uranium, breaks down, pops out an alpha particle, two protons and two neutrons. That's the helium of a nucleus atom, and that's going to interact with some random free-floating electrons, which are fucking everywhere, and that's going to become proper helium. That's where we get helium now. We are running out of these deposits on Earth. That's why we're running out of helium on Earth, because we are running out of these deposits. Um, there are still some that are surely out there that did be discovered, but they're going to become more and more, and more uh, uh, rare and more and more valuable as we go along. Um, the helium that comes out of these deposits that isn't collected by us, it just floats off into space. There's it just gravity cannot hold it down. It's just going to float away. So that's why we're running out of helium. That's how that makes sense. Um, and really quick, I don't know if this is jumping ahead, so feel free not to answer. Yeah. Did our sun create the, our planets? And what is our sun creating right now? So our sun didn't create the elements that made our planet. It would have been a previous star. But our sun did make our planet in that it formed the accretion disk that led to our planet. So a different star went supernova and made all of this. And then our sun formed the planet by way of its accretion disk. Okay? Really, really good question. We're talking about generations of stars here. Okay? We're not just talking about just us. We're talking about generations of stars. Remember, the, the solar system, the universe has been here. The universe has been here about 13.8 billion years. That's a lot of time. And these stars take, you know, one on our star is has around about 8 or so, 8 to 10 billion year life cycle. So we're on, like, probably generation 3 stars now making planets like ours. Okay? And what is our sun creating right now? And our sun right now is creating... more of this. Our sun right now is not a, a very big star, it's a small star. So our sun's making helium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, neon, and sulfur right now. And Mainly helium. Our suns form the same way as planets. Yes, just by gravity. Suns are formed the same way by planets, uh, same, same way as planets, it's just gravity. The difference between a star and a planet is that a planet is much, much smaller. Jupiter, Jupiter is the biggest planet in our solar system. If it were much bigger, it could become a very small star, because Jupiter is mostly made of hydrogen and helium. So if Jupiter were, you know, maybe double its size, we would have what we call a, a red dwarf star or a brown dwarf star, one of the very, very smallest stars in the whole universe. Brown dwarf, not red dwarf, pardon me. Red dwarfs are quite a bit bigger. But brown dwarf stars are the smallest stars in the whole universe. Jupiter is almost there. So if Jupiter were much bigger. Also, fun fact, that's why we don't have another planet. Um, in between Mars and Jupiter, we have an asteroid belt. That asteroid belt would have been another planet, but Jupiter's so goddamn big that the gravity just tore it apart. That's why we have an asteroid belt, in case you wanted to know. Because a lot of people are like, oh, why do we have this perfect band between the rocky planets, the terrestrial planets, and the gas giants, what we call the Jovian planets? Jupiter's fault. That's all it is. And why do we have rocky planets in the center and Jovian planets, gas planets outside? Well, that's a good question, too, Forrest, for asking. Thank you so much. Um, it's because... You have these thermal gradients. As you go away from the star, it gets colder and colder, and the solar winds become less and less powerful. Close to the star, rock isn't going to solidify. You can't have solid rock close to the star. So you have a certain limit here where you can have solid rock. There we have the terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. You get to a certain point where you can have liquid water now. This is where you know, our planet lives in this area, the Gold Goldilocks zone. People like to say that we're so special that we live in this Goldilocks zone. Goldilocks zone is thousands and millions of miles wide. It's not like if our Earth was one foot to the left or the right, it would all be fucked up. No, we're talking huge distance here. Um, uh, past a certain point, the solar winds blasting these planets isn't strong enough. And so that's where we get these big gas giants. All that gas that's around uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, that would have been here on Earth too, but the sun blasted it off to the back of the solar system. That's why we have the gas giants back there. And indeed, when you look at literally any solar system, it follows that same format. With all the terrestrial rocky planets towards the center, and if it has gas giants, they're way out towards the back of the solar system. Does this make sense? Okay? Do we have any other questions before we move on to the next big part? Um, just a question about what a hypernova is and how it forms, but that's not it. Uh, hypernova just... Goddamn big supernova. That's all you need to know. That's all it is. Okay? So, now, 
The next part is really, really, really important. Okay, let me make sure I covered everything. We covered supernova, we covered nebulae. Yes, okay, secondary nuclear synthesis. Uh, uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay, yes. Oh, I didn't cover one thing that I wanted to. Uh, do you wonder why here on Earth, okay, it's, we have salt water. We have oceans on Earth that are salty, and then we have lakes and rivers and streams inside that aren't salty, right? Um, that's because it rains here on Earth, and it rains and it washes ions off of the land when all these ions accumulate in the lowest possible point, which is sea level. That's how the ocean gets salty. That's why lakes aren't salty. We have plate tectonics moving around the crust of the Earth. Lakes form inside in freshwater, in inland areas. They're new. They're fresh. They're not going to be salty because the oceans have been filling up with salt for billions and billions and billions of years that washed off the rocks. Lakes inland, we do have some saltwater lakes that are either old as shit or they at one point had ocean access that was filling them with salt water and then land moved and, and closed that off. So this is where we get salty oceans, just so you know. Uh, one thing that I forgot to mention in there but it makes me very happy is that the oceans got salty because literally just it rained for a few billion years. <laughs> um, okay, so now let's move on to my next favorite part, okay? We talked about how we make all these elements here in these stars, right? We make all these elements. Notice some of these elements are made even in small stars, right? Well, there's six elements that are really, really important, okay? And they are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Schnapps. You can remember that, okay? Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Remember I said a minute ago that here in my wedding ring, these atoms of silver come from exploding stars, and that's the only place that we can get them. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Hydrogen's always been there, right? Hydrogen's all around all the time. But carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, those come from even small stars like ours, right? Even small stars like ours make these elements. Those six elements make up 98% of every single cell in the world. Everything is made of these six elements, everything that's alive. If you throw in calcium, which is made in large stars, you've got over 99.5% of you. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, and calcium is 99.5% of you watching this right now. What's that extra half of a percent? Trace elements, a little bit of potassium, a little bit of iron, a little bit of, of, of you know, whatever else, things like this. Little tiny, tiny bit iodine in there, you know, tiny, tiny half of a percent, which are also made in stars. Planets, we said, are made from the dust from exploding stars. So are you. Literally all life is made from star stuff, from the guts of exploding stars, from the leftovers, right? This ring came from a supernova. So did I, and so did you. And so did the phone that you're watching me on right now, by the way. All the atoms that make that, and the atoms that make the, sand, uh, the, the ground that you're sitting on right now. There you go. That's also made from exploding star. Literally all of this. Okay? You are made of stardust. Two really important lessons from this. Number one is if anybody ever treats you like less than a star, fuck that person. Don't, don't associate with them. You are. You literally are. And second of all, if you ever treat yourself like anything less than a star, you're acting foolishly because science just proved it to you. So, uh, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, calcium, these things make you take calcium out of there because you don't really need it for everything. You've got over 98% of literally everything. Literally everything. Every living creature on this planet. Okay? Okay. Um, if you want to hear more about how we're all made of stardust, um, Carl Sagan was a great astrophysicist from a long time ago who said way more poetically than I am. <laughs> I encourage you to look him up. Hmm. So, these elements make life. How? I hear you cry. How do these elements make life? What, do they just get together and have a fucking committee meeting? What is that, right? No, we're going to talk about it. So, here we've got the Ure Miller experiment, okay? 1950s here in America, two biochemists, Stanley Ure and Harold, uh, sorry, Stanley Miller and Harold Ure, pardon me, um, 
get together and they do this awesome little experiment where they took here is a little container of some water. They have fire underneath it. It evaporates. It goes down into this container over here where it gets zapped with some electrodes. They've got water. They've got ammonia. They've got uh, uh, some methane. They've got some uh, uh, hydrogen. They've got all the things that you would expect to find on any fledgling planet, right? All the things that you would totally expect on any little Earth that just formed. It cools down. It gets zapped with electricity. It cycles back through. It evaporates. It cools down. It gets zapped with electricity. It evaporates. It cools down. It gets zapped with electricity. What they're doing here is they're simulating the patterns of Earth. They're simulating all these elements that you would find on any planet. We find these elements on asteroids, on other planets, on, on you know, rocks in space. They're everywhere. So we take all these early, early, just simple ingredients, and we just get them hot, like they're evaporating in the sun, get them cold, like they're raining, zap them with lightning, like some electrical storm happened. Just normal, normal processes. They run this experiment. They just let this thing burble for a little while. And they come back a little, uh, after a long time, and they take some of the samples out, and they find that the water has gone from clear to like this awful, turpid, brown nastiness. What's that all about? They test this water, and they find that it is full of amino acids. Amino acids. What are amino acids? Amino acids are the things that build proteins that make life. Okay? This is what we call chemical evolution. Chemical evolution is when very simple, inorganic ingredients by totally natural processes form organic, like the ingredients of life by themselves. They form organic macromolecules all by themselves. There are four macromolecules that make life. Okay? Four of them. They are. I'm going to spell proteins wrong. I believe it's E before I in proteins. I think it's one of the ones that breaks the rule. I'm, I can't remember. Uh, proteins, can you see that? Is that even legible? P-R-O-T-E-I-N. Yes! Got it right. Is that legible? I'm trying to find the right color so you guys can actually see. Are you inverted? Yes. You see that? Kind of. I'll put this last one on top. Proteins. Carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and lipids. Okay? These are the four macromolecules that make life, that make you, that make everything. Okay? All living organisms deal with these guys here. Okay? Each one of these is a polymer which means it's a, a molecule of like a big repeating chain, like beads on a string, every single one of these, okay? We're going to talk about each one a little bit. We're going to stick on one of them for a long time, okay? Proteins are made of amino acids. They are chains of amino acids that then fold up. The chain of amino acids is called a primary structure. Then it folds into this one shape called an alpha helix or a, a beta pleated sheet. That's called a secondary structure. That then forms in this horrible glob. That's called a tertiary structure. Sometimes a bunch of horrible globs come together. That's called a quaternary structure. Blah, blah, blah. This is how proteins work, okay? So proteins are what make up your skin, your muscles, your bones, everything made of proteins, right? Carbohydrates are sugars. Big, long chain of sugars, right? So you have a simple sugar like sucrose, like, uh, uh, not sucrose, probably glucose. Uh, um, sucrose is multiple. Um, you have a simple sugar like glucose or like fructose. You stick those together. Now you have two sugars together. That's called sucrose. You get a bunch of them together. You have a polysaccharide. These are what make carbohydrates, like starches and things, right? Carbohydrates. What are lipids? Lipids are fats. Lipids are fats. You end up with uh, some sort of weird, kinky, strange hydrocarbon chain that repels water. That's going to be a lipid. Isn't that fun? Um... You have different kinds of things. Sometimes you have what are called phospholipids. Phospholipids are where you have this big, crazy hydrocarbon chain coming off that repels water. And then on the backside, you've got this great big phosphorus that, uh, group that attracts water. So you have a hydrophobic end and a hydrophilic end. One end that repels water and one end that attracts water. Those are really cool. We're going to talk about those in a minute. Okay? 
Here's a fun fact. If you take lipids, go to your kitchen and pour a little bit of oil in some water, right? A little bit of lipid in some water. What happens to it? It forms a bubble all by itself. You don't have to tell it to do it. Nobody has to tell it to do it. It just bloop, forms a bubble all by itself, forms a little ball because a sphere is the smallest possible surface area. And that means that it's the most possibly protected energetically from the water around it. It would take more energy for it to make any kind of shape. And remember, the universe is lazy. It doesn't want to use extra energy. So everything's gonna be the most energetically simple thing possible. So you've got these lipids that naturally form these spheres in water. There you go. That's why it the, 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 the does it. These lipids that naturally form out of normal stuff, under normal circumstances, nothing special, naturally form spheres. The amino acids that make proteins that naturally form out of natural stuff, totally normal, just might get caught in one of those spheres. And now what have you got? You've got something that damn near represents a cell. Right? This stuff that totally naturally comes from just normal processes that naturally assume the shapes that we're talking about can naturally come together and naturally make some sort of an early cell. It's very easy. You can do it in a goddamn jar, right? So imagine if we did that here on this planet over a billion years. Sure. Now the Harold Urey experiment, uh, sorry, the Urey Miller experiment, um, it's, it's been redone and tweaked and revamped, and it's been criticized for having some things left out, and it's been criticized for not putting some, and all those things. So it's been done a million other times with a million different other things added into it. We've added in different elements and different things. We've also found that it wasn't necessarily something that happened on the surface of the planet. Deep sea hydrothermal vents, okay, so volcanoes under the water, are pumping out acids all the time and bases. What are acids and bases? They have proton gradients. They have, an acid is just a chemical that has a bunch of extra protons in it, basically. There's actually a few different models of an acid, but all you need to know is an acid is a solution with a shit ton of extra protons in it, okay? What is a base? Is a base is something that has not enough. It's got, 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 got a bunch of negative charges in it. So when these things neutralize, you have electrical charges moving from one place to the next. How do your cells make energy today? Proton gradient. You've got mitochondria that just pass protons across a membrane, turn a little protein called ATP synthase, make adenosine triphosphate, that's how your body works. Proton gradient. Where can you find natural proton gradients right now in the world? Hydrothermal vents, deep under the ocean, just hanging out there all day long. Where can you find the building blocks of lipids and proteins? The exact same place. Do you know that we have found amino acids on asteroids? out in space, floating around, put a probe on one, what do we find? The building blocks of life. What creature do you think went out there and shit those up there? Nobody did. They form naturally, all by themselves. Okay? So we've got the building blocks of life, we've got the thing that makes energy in your body even today happening naturally, all by itself. Life starts all by itself. Need water, though? This is happening under the ocean, remember? So we got it. <laughs> We're there. Okay? Carbohydrates are more complex. They take life to make them because they're, they are sugars that are being put together. But the other thing here is nucleic acids. This is your DNA and your RNA. Okay? Your DNA and your RNA are nucleic acids. Now, for a long time, scientists have debated which one of those, DNA or RNA, came first. As for me, I'm an RNA came first kind of guy, and here's why. Okay, RNA is really cool because it's not just something that carries information. It also works as a catalyst to make reactions happen. What does a catalyst mean? A catalyst is something that lowers the activation energy of a reaction. What does that mean? Lowering the activation energy means it makes the reaction happen easier and faster and with less energy. Okay, so RNA carries genetic information. It can also make more of itself, and it can also make other reactions happen faster. What does this mean? Okay, think about how proteins uh, are made in your body today, right? You have uh, this mRNA. Can you see that? Do I need to write that bigger? Yes, I'm gonna write that bigger. Okay, so your body makes mRNA. 
Okay? Your that R's good? are terrible. My R's are wonderful, and I don't want to hear it. Okay? You have mRNA, messenger RNA. Okay? This stuff makes the proteins happen in your body. How does it do that? Well, it goes to a ribosome to get red. What are ribosomes made out of? Ribosomes are made out of RNA. Ribosomal RNA. RRNA. That's what makes ribosomes. Ribosomes aren't membrane-bound organelles. They are made of RNA. What happens in the ribosome? Well, you have something bringing over amino acids to build the protein. What brings over the amino acids? Transfer RNA. tRNA. So when your body makes proteins, it uses RNA to tell RNA to use RNA to make a protein. Y'all, you can do it in a goddamn jar. It's so easy. So, this is why I'm an RNA world hypothesis dude, because RNA is something that is so unbelievably useful. Why do we have DNA then? Why do we have DNA if RNA is so easy? Because DNA is really, really good for long-term storage. DNA is a lot more stable. You can make, you can divide it, make more of it, and pack it up into a little tight wad, make a rope called chromatin, because that's what you get, you get your DNA. DNA, here. <laughs> There's your DNA. You take this DNA, you ever take in your hair? If you have long hair and you twist it and twist it and twist it until it starts to double up and twist back on itself, right? You twist it and twist it and twist it around these big proteins called histones, and you twist it and twist it and twist it until it forms this tight wad called chromatin, and then this chromatin forms this body called a chromosome. Gasp! Yeah. So this is how your DNA works. DNA wraps around proteins called histones, wraps up into a thick rope called chromatin, forms these things called chromosomes. It's super easy to divide those and split them up, and then you have two sets of chromosomes in your cell, and then you have this thing called cytokinesis, where these actin filaments tighten and put a stricture around the cell, and what's going to happen to the lipid membrane around the... Well, remember, lipids form bubbles naturally, so when you squish them together, they make two bubbles, and then your cell divides, and you've just made dividing life out of nothing! It's awesome! So it's not difficult at all to say that these very simple ingredients that are found literally anywhere in the universe that naturally form organic molecules by natural processes then naturally started making more of themselves. It's just not that hard. And what you get is this very, very, very early organism. Something that would have been insanely simple. Not like bacteria would have been unbelievably complex to this thing. We're talking about a very, very simple cell. Very simple membrane, very simple organic uh, genetic material, very simple proteins. We're talking about the basics here. The basics. And we call that bitch LUCA. Your class is freaking out. They should be. If you're not freaking out right now, you're not paying attention. LUCA, which stands for the last universal common ancestor. Okay? There probably was lots of very early life. There probably was several different times when life started up. Luca's the one that stuck. And from Luca, we get everything. Everything. Every single thing that has ever lived on this planet past that point is related to Luca. Okay? Now, think about this, okay? So we're going to talk about evolution for a second. We're about to get into it. We're about to. But actually, no, I should stop here and I should take a break and I should ask if we have questions. 30 second break. Does anybody have any questions about what we call, this is whole process called abiogenesis, life from non-life. Does anybody have questions about the, 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 the uh, Miller-Urey experiment? Does anybody have any questions about early macromolecules? Does anybody have any questions about how life starts? Any questions at all? Really quick, I just want to say some of your patrons are here in the chat. Awesome, thank you so much for being here, my patrons. And um, their private stream is coming up this Saturday. Yeah, on Saturday, uh, so we, for my patrons on Patreon, we have a, a VIP live stream once a month on the first Saturday of every month. And this Saturday, we're going to be talking about chemistry. Um, I'm going to go over for about an hour or so, like, intro to chemistry 101, breaking down 
how atoms and molecules work, what chemical bonds are. We're going to talk a lot about carbon because organic chemistry is my shit. Um, so we're going to talk about the basics of chemistry this Saturday. So if anybody wants to tune in uh, from a Patreon, I encourage you to be there. I know I've got one or two that are already excited about it. Uh, Utani wants to know, how do we know there aren't survivors of non-LUCA life? How do we know there aren't survivors of non-LUCA life? Um, it is, of course, possible. The thing is, it would be different, at least kind of, and we don't see any major differences. Luca might have been many things, um, but like, we, uh, we don't see any differences, so it's reasonable to assume that we're all coming from the same place. Um, is it possible? Of course. Do we have any evidence to suggest it? No. So back to the very beginning, of course there are other options, but we don't have any evidence to point in that direction, so it would be unreasonable for us to make the assumption. Um, if the process of creating life is so simple, yep. how come we haven't been able to do it? And has it been successfully done in a lab? Phenomenal question. If creating life is so simple, why hasn't it happened again? Why don't we do it? Why don't they think? Um, the thing is, remember I said, these processes to make these early macromolecules can happen in a jar. But to go from there takes time, it seems. So, like, the planet is about 4.6 billion years old. We don't see the first signs of life until around a billion years ago. And I'm going to talk about why here in just two seconds. Um, remind me if I don't. Um, talk about the Hadean period. Uh, but the... Uh, um, fuck, what was I saying? Right. Why don't we see more life? Because it takes a long-ass time. It took about a billion years for it the first time. Um, we just don't have experiments that are big enough, can run well enough to do that. Is it possible? Sure, maybe we should do it sometime, but we, we don't. But the other thing is that if there was an environment that could start life, you're talking about an environment that is full of nutrients, absolutely rich with nutrients, and ripe for new creatures to grow. If that environment existed on Earth today, something that's already alive would swoop in and take advantage of it, and it would slurp up all the nutrients. So like, new life starting today, just doesn't, it's not going to happen because we already have life that's going to completely destroy any chance of that happening. So, if you were to have some sort of completely sterile experiment jar, you can run this thing for a very, very, very long time, maybe, um, but the reason why the Harold Urey experiment didn't produce full-on life is because it only lasted a little while, it didn't last for the years and years and years and years and years and thousands of years it would have taken, <clears throat> and also because we didn't have new energy coming into it all the time, that's another thing, is that People talk about how life violates the second law of thermodynamics because it's going against entropy. No. Second law of thermodynamics is uh, a closed system. The Earth is not a closed system. We've got new energy coming in all the time. And so, with this, you would need a lot more pieces to the puzzle than we can possibly manage in an experiment today. And you need thousands and thousands of years to run that experiment. So that's why. I'm going to ask Good question. this question. Um, this goes out to my conspiracy theorists out there. Oh, Lord. So if life happened here on Earth, yes. the way you described it, yes. does that mean it is possible that there is other life out there in the universe? Not only is it possible, it's fucking guaranteed. See, this comes down to what we call the Fermi Paradox, which is that life is really, really easy to make. We can show that it's easy to make. And the universe is really, really, really big. It's completely insane to assume that this is the only planet that has life on it. Completely ridiculous to assume that. We're talking about one planet out of eight. We have moons in this solar system that could probably have life on them. Talk about Europa? Girl, get over it. You've got thousands upon thousands of other stars, hundreds of thousands of other stars in this galaxy alone with lots and lots of planets orbiting them. We've got countless billions of galaxies out there, full of hundreds of billions of stars apiece, full of planets. Where's all the aliens then? So, the thing is, the universe must be absolutely teeming with life, but in order to find aliens, remember, the fastest possible communication that we have is light, right? The fastest possible communication we have is sending radio signals out. Light travels at about 186,000 miles per second. That's fucking fast. But the closest possible star to us is four light years away. So at 186,000 miles per second, the speed limit of the universe, it's still going to take light four years to get from here to Proxima Centauri, the next possible star. If aliens are there on Proxima Centauri, right, we need to, we need to be at a technological age where we can send a signal. We need to be sending it in the exact right direction. 
and we need to be sending it at the right time so that four years from now, those aliens are also at a technological level where they can receive those kind of communications and are listening for them in the exact direction in which we are sending them. That's a lot to ask of just random chance. So we're sending out signals looking for aliens. We're listening for signals listening for aliens. The, Earth, the universe is 13.8 billion years old. We're talking about 13.8 billion years, billion with a B, big number, where something could evolve and is able to send these communications and is able to hear these communications and is even listening for them and is even interested in them and so many different things. Maybe somebody's heard our communication and they're like, eh, they're just earth monkeys, fuck them, and they just don't even pay attention. That's possible too. So, like, there's a lot going on here. Remember... If I have a cell phone, that doesn't mean I'm connected to anybody. I still need to have these cell phone towers to make it work. I still need to have electricity to make it work. I still need to have somebody to call that wants to pick up the phone. Okay? So, like, there's a lot of factors in there. Um, that's a big thing in the Fermi Paradox, is that we don't know where all the aliens are, but it's entirely possible that they've are, they're have they there, they're just not listening. Or they're not evolved enough yet. They haven't developed enough yet. They've already wiped themselves out from nuclear war. They're on another planet that we're not pointed at right now. We're at a million different things. Or, we're, everything's lined up perfectly, but their galaxy is three million light years away, so it's going to take three million years for the signal to get there. So it doesn't matter. We're, not, we're all going to be dead by that time. It doesn't matter, you know what I mean? So, lots and lots and lots of issues there with communicating with aliens. The universe is really big. That's the thing you got to remember. <laughs> The universe you, is really, really big. If you think about human history, how long did it take us to reach and find other continents? Precisely. Just on this Earth. Precisely. If, if humans died today, the total amount of planets that we have discovered or completely explored is zero. We haven't even completely explored the planet that we're on. You're telling me that we're going to figure out the rest of this planet? No. Not <laughs> we are far off. We are very far off. Um, and I'll just ask one more question before yeah. we go on. Croissant wants to know, What's up, what period of Earth's history did Luca start? Would have been, um, I cannot remember the name, yo, right after the Hadean. So that's the thing, we were going to talk about this as well. Why did it take a billion years for life to start? Um, the Earth is 4.6 billion years old. The first billion years of that is what we call the Hadean period. We have what we call the heavy bombardment going on. Okay, so we've got... The, remember I showed those pictures of, of these asteroids and everything colliding together? When the Earth first formed and was first a planet, there's still a lot of asteroid shit out there. There's still a lot of things in the way as we're orbiting around the sun. There's still a lot of stuff in our path. We're still colliding with things all the time. So we have what we call the period of heavy bombardment, where all the time, every day, boom, 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 this planet's getting decimated. And so the Earth would have been just a molten hellscape for a billion or so years. Um, it wasn't until this place cooled down and we actually had a crust and actually had normal weather patterns that we can then start talking about making a living things because everything that would have been possibly to be alive would have been wiped out by another asteroid, another asteroid, another asteroid. So I don't remember what the name of the period is off the top of my head. Um, it's been a long time since so I had to know that, but it would have been right after the Hadean, but before the Paleozoic. So we're talking kind of wiggle little area in there. It might have actually been the Paleozoic, the very early part. Yes, yeah, probably would have been the Paleozoic because that was like right there at the end. Because Paleozoic involves the Cambrian, but I always get the two confused in my head. So, I'm going to go and say Paleo's own final answer, but fact check me. Double check. <laughs> okay, so, now, we have life started on this planet. If life is there, then we're going to have evolution. Evolution is natural progress. Going to happen. Now, some of you, when I say evolution, think of this. This is fucking stupid. This is called the Zallinger Diagram, um, and it's from like an old Time Life book from the 1950s, and it shows this chimpanzee-looking dude like leveling up into a human. This is not how evolution works at all, because what that is is it's a gross oversimplification of one thing just gave birth to another thing that then became a human someday. That's not how that works at all. Evolution is a tangled web. It is a mess. It is a thousand different steps between one species and the next. Wright's rule says that speciation can be completely random based on uh, uh, adaptive trends. That throws everything into completely... Just, it, it's not an intuitive a lot of the times. It's weird. I'm going to give you a very basic understanding of how evolution works, okay? I can literally talk... I, evolution is my job to understand. I can talk about it 
for years. Um, I'm going to break it down for you in a very simple way, okay? You need three things to understand how evolution works. Three basic ideas to understand evolution, okay? Number one is that genes exist. That's it. We've got DNA. It exists. It's heritable. You pass on your DNA to your offspring, okay? So genes exist. They're heritable. They get passed on from generation to generation. That's the first thing you need to know. If you can understand that, you can understand evolution. Set two. Different versions of genes exist. What we call alleles. Okay? So you've got this gene here for brown hair. You have this other gene here that is also for hair, but this one is for blonde hair. Okay? Different versions of these genes exist. That's number two. If you can understand that, you can understand evolution. Number three is that some versions of these genes are better for life in different environments. Okay? If I have the genes for climbing trees and for surviving on fruits, I am not going to do very well in the desert, but I'm going to do great in the jungle. Genes with a G. Genes with a G, not blue genes, yes. Um, if I have the genes for digging in sand and going weeks without water, I'm going to do a great job in the desert. Probably not really well suited for life in the trees, in the jungle, right? So different genes are better suited for life in different environments. If you can understand that, you can understand evolution. Because those three axioms together really break down how evolution works. Is that every living thing has genetic material. DNA or RNA, right? Every living thing has these genes. There's different versions of the genes out there. And depending on which version you have, you could do well in different environments. So if you are living in the desert and you start coming up with genes that require a lot of water, you need to drink all the time, you're going to die. And you're not going to pass those genes on. Okay? And the genes go away. That's it. They're gone. Nobody even knows. Nobody needs to know they exist. Gone. If you live in the desert, and you start developing genes that allow you to get longer and longer renal tubes in your kidneys, and you can now go longer and longer without water, you're going to have a lot of kids. You're going to live just fine. And you're going to pass on that DNA, and that DNA is going to spread, and more and more and more things are going to get it. And this is the definition of evolution. The definition of evolution is a change in gene frequencies in a population over multiple generations. Evolution doesn't happen to one person. Evolution doesn't happen to one individual. You can't say, when am I going to evolve? You're not going to. Okay? The whole population of a species evolves because over time, new mutations bring in new information, new versions of these genes. And the ones that do well have lots and lots and lots of babies. And over multiple generations, the gene frequency, the total genes of the whole population changes in a direction. That's how evolution works. And we have different kinds of evolution in this way. Okay? Here's a graph. Okay? And I'm assuming everybody's seen a, a graph like this before. We have what's called a bell curve, like this. Okay? Can you see that? Yes. Okay. So, let's say we're talking about tails. Okay? Tail length. Right? There's some sort of chipmunk creature, or whatever, and they have tails. Radical. Okay? Here's the frequency of genes. Some of them have... Short tails, some of them have long tails. And here is the number of individuals. Okay? Right here in the middle, you have your median. Okay? So here is all of these weird chipmunk creatures. Got it? There are very
very few of them that have super duper short tails, but they do exist. Most of them have this kind of middle ground medium tail, and very, very few of them have a really, really long tail. Okay? This is diversity, genetic diversity. Okay? New mutations popping up all the time for short tails, for long tails, whatever. Okay? So now we're going to have speciation happen. Now evolution is going to take place. Evolution is all about selection pressure. What's causing things to die or to live based on the genes that they're expressing? Okay? You can't see the full left side of the graph. Can't see the full left side of the graph? Oh, where has the number? Here. There you go. Okay. So, here is the short-tailed creatures. Let's say that, uh, just like squirrels do today, these creatures can use their tails to distract predators. So if you have a super short tail, you're going to die. If you have a much longer tail, you're actually better off. So these guys die off, more and more of these guys live, and slowly, over multiple generations, our graph starts to do this. And now, this is the average over here. See that? So our graph is just sliding to the right. Just sliding over to longer and longer tails. This is called directional selection. Okay? Directional selection is when one end of this spectrum is useful, and so all the whole population's genes slide over in that direction. Remember, it's not magic. These things didn't wake up today and say, I really want a longer tail. I'm going to evolve one today. That doesn't happen. We're talking about these ones over here are dying. They're not having kids anymore. So the average genes are moving over this way. These ones are having lots of kids. So the whole population evolves. This is called directional selection. What happens when they get to a certain point Okay, here's our graph again. Here's the average. Okay, they get to a certain point now where having a really long tail any longer is actually kind of harmful. The tail gets tangled up in stuff. It's just a, it's a nuisance, it's obnoxious, it's like Rapunzel's hair, it just sucks. It can't deal with it anymore. Having a short tail is a bad thing too, because it gets you eaten. Right? You can't use it to distract predators or whatever the fuck you're doing with it, right? So, short tails are bad. Long tails are bad. So you still have all these creatures living here. Both sides are going to die. The middle side is going to live. And our graph is going to start to look like this. Where it gets skinnier. Where now, more and more and more of these creatures are living in this exact middle round, okay, uh, side, and both extremes are dying off. I'm going to say it again. Nobody's telling them to do this. Nobody's like, oh, I wish I didn't have so long of a tail. I'm going to evolve a different one today, right? These guys die. These guys live. And so more and more and more of them start to live this way because these genes aren't being passed on. You are what your genes say you are. If you didn't get the genes, you don't exist. So these guys with the genes for short tails and these guys with the genes for long tails don't pass those genes along. They don't have babies. They don't exist anymore. These genes don't exist. Only the ones with the middle tails have babies. So more and more of the population looks this way. This is called stabilizing selection. Okay, so the first one was directional or moving. This is stabilizing selection. Let me show you another one. This one's my favorite. So here you've got your population. Same graph. Here you've got your average here. Okay? New scenario. Okay? New scenario. If you have a really short tail, you can fit into tight spaces. You can avoid predators really well. If you have a really long tail, you can wiggle around and distract predators, which helps you get away. You can survive really well. If you have a middle medium tail, you fine, but like whatever, you know? 
these guys and these guys on the extremes end up living. These guys in the middle end up dying off. What happens then? Well, now we get a graph that looks like this. See that? Where the extremes have more and more babies, and the middle, the median, becomes less and less useful and dies off. And eventually, this causes a speciation where these will become two completely different species, where they'll completely differentiate from each other. And you have the short hair, tail variety and the long tail variety are completely different. This is called disruptive selection. It's my favorite because I'm pretty disruptive too. So this is disruptive selection. I'm going to say it again because people don't understand it. Nobody's telling them to do this. Nobody's like, oh man, I better evolve today. Nobody's like, oh, I better come up with new genes today. We're talking about random mutations being selected for through non-random variables. Non-random selection of random mutations. Okay? Is there more to this? Absolutely, fucking lutely there is. Okay? I have studied this for a decade, and there's still questions. But this is the basics that you need to understand, is that genes exist. Those genes are heritable. Different versions of the genes exist. Different versions of the genes are better for different situations. And if you have the right genes, you're gonna have kids. Evolution is all about reproduction. Why hasn't evolution cured cancer yet? Because you usually get cancer after reproductive age. Why hasn't evolution made it so our backs aren't hurting so bad when we're 60? Because you usually have kids by the time you're 20, right? In, in, in the wild. I don't encourage you to do that. But out in the wild, it's when you have a kid. So, like, there's no reason. There's no selection pressure. You don't die and not have kids if you have back problems in your 60s. So there's no reason to change the genes. But if you're going to die before you turn 10, that's a problem. Evolution's going to weed that out. And only the kids who survive past 10 to have babies are going to pass on their genes. And that's where selection pressure is. That's the direction of evolution. Does this make sense? For those of you saying that this is not true and that's not how it works, I thoroughly, after this, I encourage you to go on Google and see, pick any dog breed and see what they look like 100, 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. Remember, dogs are a great example of evolution because dogs, every single dog breed you can think of is just a, a, a wolf. Wolves that met with humans, Canis lupus, gray wolves. We bred wolves to become dogs. They're all the same species. This dog species, we want it to be able to fit down little foxholes. So we breed them, only the shortest ones, we breed them together. And then out of that litter, we take the shortest ones and we breed those together. And out of that litter, we take only the shortest ones and we breed those together. Until eventually, we get a wiener dog. Okay? We just slowly change the genes by only allowing things to breed the way we want them to. We want a dog that can fight other giant creatures. We breed an Irish wolfhound, the biggest, scariest dog. We make sure only the biggest, scariest ones have babies. Out of those babies, only the biggest, scariest ones have more babies. We slowly breed things together. Okay? So this is the whole purpose of what we call this artificial selection. Artificial selection is when we take this animal or a plant or something that we like and we breed it to bring out characters that we want. Go to Google and look up what a natural peach or a natural apple or natural corn looks like. Tiny, bitter, gross, useless things. You need a thousand of them to feed yourself. We breed them to be bigger and sweeter and more nutritious. Literally every single thing you can buy in a grocery store is a GMO because we modified their genetics through artificial selection over the past 10,000 years. We've changed them, right? So you want better corn? Oh, this is a really big sweet ear of corn. I want to plant that. All the tiny little bitter shitty corns, throw them away. And slowly we change their genetics through directional selection until we get to where we want and then we do stabilizing selection. 
there are people who are saying that's not evolution because we are forcing the change. We are selectively breeding. All right. Evolution doesn't have to be natural. Natural selection is one form of evolution. Okay. Remember I said a minute ago, the definition, the textbook definition of evolution is a change in gene frequencies within a population over multiple generations. Evolution can be guided by us. It can be guided by nature. It does not matter. It's a change in the genetics of a population over multiple generations. Okay? That's how it works. That's what evolution is all about. Mm. <clears throat> okay. You take a question? Do you still go? Ahead? Yeah, let's take a couple more questions, and then we're going to move on to the next part. Okay. Um, I keep getting this question. Yeah. If we evolved from monkeys, why are there still monkeys, and why aren't they evolving? Phenomenal question, and we were going to get to this later, but we'll take a second to do it now, okay? We'll take a second to knock this out. It's going to take me two seconds to draw this. Is that all in frame? Yes. Okay. Uh, monkeys still exist and all this stuff, okay? So, first thing you need to know. Humans are great apes. We are a species of ape. Um, so we're not going to talk about monkeys yet. We can go for, farther than that, okay? 65 million years ago, you have the very first primate ancestors called Plesiodapiforms in here, okay? In here, in this area, you have monkeys, you have gibbons, you have all sorts of cool stuff, right? In the monkeys, you have old world and new world. Here about 12 million years ago, we have our common ancestor with orangutans. Here about 10 million years ago, you have our common ancestor, about nine actually, with gorillas. Here about seven million years ago, you have our common ancestor with chimpanzees and bonobos. And here's humans. Why are there still apes and all these other things? Because we didn't come from chimpanzees. Chimpanzees and we share an ancestor. Right here, seven million years ago, my mark is upside down and it threw me off. <laughs> right here, from 7 million years ago, was an animal that was not a chimpanzee, was not a human, was not anything in between, right? Here's this animal, and some of their descendants evolved to become chimpanzees, and somewhere here in the middle they split again, and we get bonobos. Some of these creatures went this way, and we get humans. Is it one after the next? Did this creature give birth to a human? No, absolutely not. There's a million steps here. We have Artipithecus rambidus, uh, and all the Artipithecines. There's actually a few of them. We have uh, uh, Sacalanthropus. We have Ororin. We have Australopithecus afarensis, Australopithecus uh, uh, um, animensis, Australopithecus, I'm not doing these in order, Australopithecus uh, um, uh, uh, afarensis, uh, Australopithecus africanus, we have uh, Paranthropus robustus, Paranthropus boisei, we have uh, Homo hapilis, Homo ergaster, Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalus, uh, um, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo floresiensis. We have so many steps in here, not all of them are connected. Some of them branch off and do this over here, and they, none of these are humans, right? So think about it this way, okay? Spanish comes from Latin. Spanish is a Latin language, right? Was there ever a time when a mother who spoke Latin gave birth to a child who only spoke Spanish? No, that would make no sense. It was a very slow change in dialect over several, several generations. At no point in history could you go back and say, you are now speaking Spanish, everybody before you wasn't speaking Spanish. That's all Latin, you're now Spanish. That wouldn't make any sense. That wouldn't make any sense, right? It's just slow. You are alive right now, probably, right? Okay, I'm an adult. I'm 29 years old. At what exact moment did I stop being a, a, an adolescent? And at what exact moment was I no longer a child? And at what exact moment was I no longer an infant? 
When in my life can you go and like you're counting down your watch, you're like, okay, you are now an adolescent. You are no longer a child. You are now an adolescent. Ah, nope, you are now an adult. Nope, this is different. You are now a full grown. That doesn't make sense, right? And we're talking about one person here. So when you talk about evolution, there is never a time when you know, Australopithecus was just like, there's a me, here's a human now today. That doesn't happen. It's a very slow gradient. If you had every single complete perfect skull, fossil, whatever, every single complete fossil, all the way back from, you know, pick one, from Homo erectus, right? Homo erectus, one of our most recent ancestors. They lived um, from about eh, around 2 million years to around 100,000 years ago, right? So, Here's Homo erectus. If you had every single skeleton perfect, complete, from Homo erectus all the way up to me, there is not a single time you could not go through there and go, that one's a human. Everything before it isn't. That's human right there. It's a very, very, very slow change. So why are there still apes? Because we didn't come from these apes. These apes and us share a common ancestor here. Okay? We share a common ancestor. Some of them became this thing. Some of them went this way and became these other things. And we're skipping 10 billion steps in the middle there that, between this, this graph called the cladogram. Okay? Does that make sense? It's the same thing as asking if we, if me and my family, my cousins, came from my grandfather, why do my cousins still exist? Exactly. Exactly. You know, I am not my cousin, and we both share grandparents. We can both exist at the same time, and my grandparents can exist. You are not your parents, but you look a lot like both of them put together. You are not your grandparents, but you look a little bit like your grandparents all put together. You are not your great-grandparents, right? So this is how this works. It's just slowly, slowly, slowly building up. Slow, slow, slow changes over time. And sometimes there are fast changes, right? When we look over the, the fossil record, we have this thing, so there's two different things. There's one is called phyletic gradualism and one is called punctuated equilibrium. Um, when we look over the fossil record, we sometimes see great big events where all of a sudden just a shitload of new, entirely different species pop up. Big macro evolutionary changes. And people you know, still like to say that these are different competing ideas of evolution. They're not. Um, phyletic gradualism, slow, slow, slow change over time is happening all the time. But sometimes you have an extinction event, a mass extinction happens, a bunch of new niches, a bunch of new ways of life open up. And then you have what's called adaptive radiation from there, where you have one single creature, like say the, the, the classic example is a bird, a finch, right? So you have this finch here, who has a beak like that, and some of them live in an area with great big hard nuts, and so they need a great big beak like that. And some of them live in an area where they can drink nectar out of flowers, so they have like a long, thin beak like that. And some of them eat little tiny seeds, so they have a little tiny pointy beak like that. And some of them live, and so this is what we call adaptive radiation, where you have all these new niches open up, so totally new things happen, and we have totally new life coming in, and all of these creatures share one ancestor. Here's the primordial finch, and from here we get all these different other species. And now people will say, ah, yes, but they're all still birds. We didn't have something change from one thing to the next thing. We didn't have, a very common one is people say, there's no change in kinds, right? It's just, that's a fucking thing. Um, what you have to remember is that these changes, these big macro evolutionary changes are the result of the buildup of micro evolutionary changes. Okay, and we're going to talk about that next. We're going to get into it here in just a second. But before I move on, is there anything else, baby? Uh, you didn't finish the second part of that. Why aren't monkeys evolving? Oh, why aren't monkeys evolving? Thank you so much. Um, why aren't other monkeys evolving? They are. They are. Remember, evolution is not a ladder. There's not an end goal. Every single fish isn't trying to become a human someday. Okay? These monkeys aren't trying to build cars. Evolution is all about selection pressure and what niche you live in. It's all about the way of life that you have, the, how you live, right? So if uh, these monkeys are perfectly adapted for the way that they live, for climbing trees, for eating fruits and whatever, radical, they're not going to turn into anything like us. And if they did, it would take millions and millions and millions of years. So monkeys are still evolving. 
everything is still evolving. But what you have to remember is that when you see things like, um, where's my, here. When you see things like this, okay, see this stuff like this, these posters, these diagrams, right? It's easy to say, okay, so this stuff down here is less evolved and this up here is more evolved. No, every single living thing today is the same amount of evolved, okay? We all have evolved the same amount of time. We are all well adapted for the places and the situations and the niches in which we live. We are all the same kind of evolved, right? And everything is still evolving. As long as everything is still reproducing, as long as babies are being born, evolution is taking place, okay? As long as there's more reproduction, evolution is taking place. These monkeys aren't going to evolve into humans because they have no reason to. There's no selection pressure for that. There's no reason. The reason why we evolved the way we did is because having bigger and bigger brains was better. Because tool use was better. Because walking upright was better. It was better for us. Is it better for a, an elephant? No! No, it is not! So they're not going to evolve this way. Got it? So everything is still evolving. Everything is always evolving. Everything's always evolving, and monkeys aren't just going to turn into human smarties. That's not how anything works. Um, so all of those... Um, <coughs> so we're talking for like, what is it now? Almost three hours? Sorry. Goodness. No, it's okay. All of those uh, species that you listed off showing where we came from and our common ancestors, Yeah. how do we know that those species existed, and how right. do we know that we came from them? Phenomenal. Phenomenal question. Really, really good question. Okay, how do we know they existed because of the fossil record? We can literally see the fossils. Um, now it's important to remember that species is just a term that we came up with. Okay, species is something that, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Species is, is, is a term that we came up with. It's a definition that we came up with. There are multiple different definitions of what a species is. So sometimes we kind of move things around with fossil record and say, oh, actually this thing's probably this species, this thing's probably this species. The point is take the species names out of it. I swear to God, just forget about species for a second. Just look at the fossil record. Don't pay attention to any kind of species names, right? Just look at the fossil record. And we see fossils that are several million years old that look a lot like a human, but not quite. And slowly, over the next several million years, they become more and more and more human-like until they are humans. We can literally just look at the fossil record and see these changes here, okay? see these changes um so that's that's how like it, it, you can literally look at it happening and how do we know these fossils are so old well there's several different relative and absolute dating methods so like a relative dating for example would be like uh, biostratigraphic dating we can literally say okay here's these different layers so you have um the law of superpositioning right here's the grounds here's this layer of the ground here's this layer of the ground here's this layer of the ground we know that the deeper the layer is, the older it is, because that's how new sediment is deposited on top all the time. So this fossil up here is going to be a lot younger than this fossil down here. Sometimes you have what's called an intrusion, where you have a totally new layer that cuts through all of this. That's going to be the youngest layer of them all, because it's so young it has to be able to pass through all of these guys. So this fossil came before this one, even though they're on the same level, because they're in a different layer that's intrusive. Okay? So these are old laws of superpositioning that have been along for a long time. That's biostratigraphic dating. We can say, okay, you have this fossil, it's underneath this one, so we know it's pretty old. That's relative dating, right? You can't say, well, we know we, we use the layers to determine the fossil, and we use the fossil to determine the layers. You can't do that, right? So then we have absolute dating, like radiometric dating. Carbon dating is really famous. Um, uh, but remember, carbon dating only goes back around 50,000 years. But there are other ways to date things with these elements. Um, carbon dating is one element that you, we can use. We can also use uranium. We can also use potassium, argon. We can use um, uh, thorium. Like, there's lots and lots of different radiometric clocks. And here's the fun fact. They all overlap a little bit. They overlap a little bit. So we can double check and be like, okay, this comes up with this date on this kind of dating method. Does it do the same one with this one as well? Or is it way off, right? We can check and double check ourselves. So we have these really, really, really old bones that slowly, slowly, slowly turn into things like us. And that's one of the ways we know. Um, um, here's, sorry, here's another yeah. question. Yeah. So if you just have one skeletal fossil, 
Yes. Of what, whichever species you, you, you're saying we came from in the past, if uh -huh. you, you just have one of those, yeah. how do you not know that that's just a deformed human? Really cool question, yes. So, this is one that we get a lot. How do we know that an old fossil isn't just an anomaly, a deformity, whatever? So, if you look up something like the Star Child fossil, um, that's one example of that. It's, a, it's a, a fossil of a baby that was born with hydrocephaly, very, very big deformed head, um, and a lot of people are like, oh, it's an alien, blah, blah, blah. No, it's very clear. Um, when, if we just have one fossil of a thing, that can be tricky to say, okay, is this a variation or is it a new species, whatever. Anatomists are really, really good at telling the difference between a deformity and an adaptation. Um, is the functionality is a big thing. And also you can see muscle attachments. Biologists like me were able to look at a bone and read it and read where the muscles attachments were, how big those muscles were. You can tell by the size of the attachment. So like we're able to see these things and see if they're normal or if they're aberrations. Um, so like uh, Lucy, if we, for example. So yeah, so if like you only have <clears throat> one fossil of that species. How do you know? So Lucy's a great example. So I just did Go to my YouTube channel when you're done with this. I just did a video reacting to some people who were saying that Lucy is whatever. Um, Lucy is a very famous fossil of Australopithecus afarensis. She is one specimen from that species. We only have one fossil of Lucy because Lucy was one thing. She was one creature. We have lots and lots of other fossils from Lucy's species, Australopithecus afarensis. And we have lots and lots of other fossils from other Australopithecus species. Anamensis, Robustus, Boisei, Africanus, you name it, right? We have all these other fossils. Lucy's just one. So even though she's the one you've probably heard of, we have lots and lots more that are way more and way less complete than Lucy. And we can use these things to average out and understand how these things exist. So sometimes when people say, oh, well, we just have the one fossil. We probably have lots and lots and lots of them. Lots and lots. Uh, uh, somebody, I see Littlefoot there in the chat. Littlefoot is the most complete Australopithecus afarensis fossil we have. It's like a whole fucking skeleton. It's great. And what about the missing links? Mm. Another phenomenal question. What about missing links? This is going to blow your mind. There's no such thing. Okay, so what happens is we have these two fossils here. We have us on one side and we have whatever this fossil is. And people say, all right, there's all this gap here. Where are these fossils? So we find this fossil here in the middle. And they say, aha! Now there's two missing links. See this? You didn't answer you. So we find this fossil. Aha! Look at all these gaps. Find another one. Look at all the gaps in the fossil record. Look at all the missing links. What you have to remember is, again, number one, fossils are very, very, very difficult to form. If we have one fossil from a species, that means there must have been a shit ton of things that look like that for that one to fossilize. Um, so fossils are very difficult. The fossil record is necessarily incomplete because it's so difficult for us to form these fossils. The second thing that you've got to remember is that what we're looking at is a, a pattern. We're looking at patterns in evolution, okay? We're not saying this one thing definitely became this next thing. With human evolution, it's really tricky because, like, take, for example, you know, or I, can, I don't have to draw this. Um, we see breaks in the fossil record. Two and a half million years ago, we have the last Australopithecus Afri africanus, right? Splits, and we get Homo habilis, on this side, and on this side, we have Paranthropus boisei, right? Paranthropus is an Australopithecus species that we are now arguing as scientists actually was a different genus because it's so different we should classify it differently. Does that change what it is? No, it changes our definition, our classification of it, okay? So we have this split here. These two things, they lived at the same time. Did we come from that? Yeah. Did they stop existing at the same exact instant that we started existing? No. Homo erectus. Uh, some Homo erectus became a thing called Homo heidelbergensis, which then became things like Homo sapiens. Did that Homo erectus die and shit out a human that became... No! Okay? It's these things. It's a fuzzy, fuzzy gradient, and it's a twisty, windy web with these things interbreeding with these things, and these things breaking off and uh, separating from each other, and these things becoming something different. You have different kinds of speciation events. You have what's called um, sympatric speciation, where they slowly change and slowly become something new. We have 
allopatric speciation, where they get separated, and now these guys become a totally different species without needing to break off from these because they just move to a different place or something like that. Like, there's so many different ways in which these things happen. It is a fuzzy, twisted, tangled, weird net. It's not an evolutionary tree. It's a fucked up bush full of spider webs. And that is what I'm trying to get across to you, is that there's no way that we can say that's a human and everything before it isn't. Okay, there's no way we can do it. It is a slow, gradual change marked by certain events in which we find fossils. That's all. Okay. Now, we have covered the basics of evolution. Okay? We are now going to move on to a brief history of life on this planet. We've talked about so far, we covered the Big Bang. Well, we covered what science is and how it works first, and what a theory is. We covered the Big Bang. We covered... Um, stellar genesis, we covered nuclear synthesis of stars, we talked about proton-proton chain, we talked about supernovae, we talked about nebulae, we talked about secondary stellar genesis, accretion disks, and planetary formation, we talked about how the Earth got water, we talked about how the oceans got salty, we talked about uh, 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 how the Earth's atmosphere is held in place, we talked about abiogenesis, we talked about RNA and, and nucleic acids, and the first cells, and proteins, and carbohydrates, all that stuff. Now, we get into where life has gone from this. Okay? We get into where life has gone over the last uh, three and a half billion years. Okay? So, the earliest fossils that we have of anything are little micro fossils about three and a half billion years old. Now, this is an electron micrograph picture. How can you possibly know it's anything? You can actually see these with the naked eye. Here they are. Okay, let me turn this camera a little bit again. These are called stromatolites. Okay, they look like rocks floating out in this tide pool here in the ocean. Here's one up close. These are called stromatolites. What these are, like these are boulders. These are big enough you could sit on one, right? These are huge. These are mats, mats of bacteria. Okay, layer after layer after layer after layer of bacteria. And we have these guys, which date back over 3 billion years. Okay, so very, very, very early life forms. Very, very, very early life forms. Something you should know about this, okay? Oxygen doesn't exist in just nature. Oxygen isn't a thing that just exists all by itself, okay? We have carbon dioxide, we have oxygen binding other things. Because um, oxygen is super electronegative, which means it really attracts electrons. Really good at that. So oxygen doesn't exist all by itself in nature. Um, you need something to make it. So early, early life, early, early microorganisms, those stromatolites that we're talking about. Those stromatolites are layers of what we call cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria. Cyan from the word for blue-green, right? These are photosynthetic bacteria. They don't have chloroplasts like a plant does. They do photosynthesis, though, and they take sunlight and carbon dioxide and they turn it into sugar and water. Okay? Sorry. Sugar and oxygen. <laughs> Woo! Realized what I was saying there at the end. So they take carbon dioxide and sunlight and they turn it into sugar and oxygen. Oh, I realized immediately that something's very wrong there, what I just said. Um, so, cyanobacteria are photosynthetic microorganisms that pile up to make stromatolites like this. You can still find living stromatolites today, living piles of these things, but these ones are fossils, billions and billions and billions of years old. Um, so these stromatolites uh, are just leftovers, these cyanobacteria. At one time, these guys evolved billions of years ago. They now have access to a very, very abundant resource. Huge amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere on the Earth at this time, right? So they start eating up this carbon dioxide and producing oxygen. Remember what I just said, oxygen's super electronegative. It binds to anything, okay? So at this time, very early on in the Earth's history, the Earth is super rich in iron and metals and things like that on the crust. There's nothing living on the crust. And here in the oceans, we have cyanobacteria. Um, they start making more and more oxygen. Oxygen is straight up poison. Oxygen is poop to these things, right? They're making this, and they're pooping out oxygen, right? And that causes the first mass extinction. Life dies in huge amounts on, on the Earth because they're breathing in their own poop. One cool 
uh, form of evidence that we have for this is right at this time, remember I said the earth is covered in iron, oxygen binding to iron is what we call rust. And when we look this far down in the layers of the earth, when we look this deep, we can see a band of iron that goes literally all around the earth. This band of rust in the fossil record. So we look down, or sorry, not in fossil, in geological strata. So we look deep, deep, deep down in the rocks, and we see this band of rust all the way around the entire earth. From when the cyanobacteria pumped out oxygen, literally rusted the planet, and then they all fucking died. That's, that's the first mass extinction event. Also, you should know that different oxygen concentration and carbon dioxide concentrations affects the temperature of the planet. So the more oxygen that's out there, the colder it's going to be, the more carbon dioxide, the warmer, because carbon dioxide absorbs and radiates heat really, really well. So the planet all of a sudden gets super duper cold, and it's all of a sudden now has all this poison in the atmosphere. What's going to happen? Well, two things can happen. Either life can completely stop, in which case we wouldn't be having this conversation, or life can adapt. And that's what happened, is that new life popped up that was able to utilize this oxygen and make energy out of it, just as the cyanobacteria were making energy out of the carbon dioxide. Okay? So we have now photosynthetic bacteria, and now we have new organisms that can eat oxygen to make new energy, but they need sugars, they need carbohydrates, they need other things to do it. Okay? These are the first animal cells. These are the first animals. So animals evolve first. Cyanobacteria are not plants. They are photosynthetic, but they are bacteria. These are the first heterotrophic organisms. They need to eat other things to survive, and they can breathe oxygen. Okay? Here's a fun thing that you should know. Photosynthesis is when you take water. I am not doing stoichiometry. I am not balancing this out. Is that on screen? No. Okay, so this is a gross oversimplification. I am not balancing these equations. You take water, carbon dioxide, is that on the screen still? Yes. And you turn it into some sort of hydrocarbon and oxygen. This is methane. You're not actually going to make anything like this. I can actually write it better. That's more accurate. Okay? So this is photosynthesis. You take water and carbon dioxide, you turn it into sugars and oxygen, some sort of carbohydrate and oxygen. What's cellular respiration? It's what animals do. Animals take sugars, and oxygen, and turn it into water and carbon dioxide. You notice what you're doing right now? You're breathing in oxygen, and you're breathing out carbon dioxide. You're breathing oxygen, you're taking the sugar from your breakfast this morning, breaking it down in your cells, mixing it with oxygen, oxidizing it, and here are your waste products right here. Right? It's the opposite of photosynthesis. So here's the first cyanobacteria doing this, doing a chemical reaction that changes the carbon dioxide around them into oxygen. Right? That's poison. They're dying. Animals evolve. We start doing it backwards. That's all we do. We just do it backwards. Easy peasy. Life is always a balance, okay? Ecology is always a balance. When something is using up all the resources and not putting any back, it's going to die in a really stupid way. So new organisms evolve that balance it out, okay? So here we have the first animals evolving, okay? Let me double check here, yes. Now how are they able, well these are the first you know, cells that do things like this, they might have been still, they need glucose from somewhere, right? So where do we get the mechanism to do that? Okay, you gotta get glucose from somewhere, you gotta turn it into NADP. You notice you have these things called mitochondria in your cells, right? Mitochondria are organelles in your cells that take the glucose that you put in, take the sugars, take oxygen, Turn it into energy. Remember what we talked about when we talked about abiogenesis? We talked about how life started. We talked about how proton gradients are essential for life and how your cells today still use proton gradients, right? And that we can find those proton gradients in hydrothermal vents, right? How do they do this? They use mitochondria. Where do mitochondria come from? Well, 1.5 billion years ago, 
mitochondria were their own dudes. They were their own independent organisms swimming around living life doing their own thing, right? Then we have an animal cell, something that has to eat other things to survive. Eats a mitochondria. This mitochondria is cranking out energy like crazy, yo! This mitochondria is shitting out ATP that it doesn't even need! Girl, so much ATP! And so, we didn't digest them. We just kept them around. We, mitochondria were their own thing that we swallowed up in one cell, or single-celled organism, swallow up the cellular single-celled organism, doesn't digest it, and in return, the mitochondria gets a safe place to live and gives the cell a crap load of energy to do its own thing. And that is called endosymbiosis. And it happened with another organism too, plastids. That's where plants get chloroplasts from. Chloroplasts, plastids, were their own thing, living their own life, being photosynthetic little dudes. And then they got swallowed up and they didn't get digested and now we have photosynthetic eukaryotes. How do we know this? Well, there's a bunch of evidence. My favorite one is that, um, did you know, your cells have DNA, right? Your cells have DNA in them. Mitochondria have their own DNA. And not only that, their DNA is ring-shaped. It's not a double helix in a line like yours. It's ring-shaped, which is what you get from a prokaryote. Bacteria and stuff, right? We'll talk about what that means here in a minute. Their DNA divides by itself. You don't have to do it for it. Mitochondria divide by themselves. You don't have to do it for them, right? These mitochondria divide by themselves. They have their own DNA. They have a double membrane layer. So your cells have a single uh, 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 membrane bilayer. They have two of them left over from that endosymbiosis. Okay? So these things were their own independent, independent organism. Life just got cooler. Because now, we don't just have a cell. Are you showing me something? Okay, I thought you were trying to hand me that. Um, because now, life is not just a cell with a bunch of random shit inside, it's a cell with a special pocket, a little pocket, right? A little, little section that does a certain thing, right? A little section. You've got two kinds of life on this planet. You've got... Is that all in frame? Yes. Prokaryotes. And you, karyotes. There's two words here that you need to know. It's karyote here means colonel or commander, right? And then you've got pro, which means before, and you, which means true or good. Okay? Just take like a 10 second break so you can get a water. What are you doing? Are you, you just fanning me? You look incredibly warm. We've been doing this for going on four hours now. Oh. Okay. Thank you so much, my love. You're so sweet. She's over here fanning me. Like I'm some sort of king creature. So, you've got prokaryotes don't have a nucleus, do not have membrane-bound organelles, right? The internal structure of the cells are completely non- they're just all jumbled up. Prokaryotes are like bacteria and archaea. Bacteria and archaea are prokaryotes. They just have their genetic material blah, 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 all scrambled up in there, right? Eukaryotes have a nucleus. They have membrane-bound organelles. They have compartmentalization inside of their cells, right? Their cells are compartmentalized. They have little pieces that do certain things. Guess what we just started, bitches? Endosymbiosis. Yeah, right? That wasn't the actual the official beginning, but it kind of ties in. And it's super cool. So we've now got the first actual plants and the first actual animals. They are still single cells, yo. They are still single cells. The first actual plants and the first actual animals. But we start to get cells that stick together, okay? Cells start to bundle together. So now we have multicellular organisms. The very earliest multicellular animals would have been things like sponges. Sponges don't have any differentiation between different cells, so they, all the cells do the exact same thing, so they're just siphonophores. They just let stuff pass through them. They're not siphonophores. Doesn't matter. They, they let things just pass through them, and they just diffuse and just consume whatever nutrients pass through them. Um, as you start to get cell differentiation, different cells within the same creature do different things, then some really cool stuff happens. That's when you start to develop organs within the organism, okay? Earliest fossils we have of that 
are about, oh yeah, by the way, the earliest animal fossils are around 300, and, no, sorry, 535 million years old. Uh, the earliest animal fossils are around 535 million years old, but there's new evidence that suggests that it might actually be like 600 million years. We're just kind of trying to figure it out right now. It's absolutely brand new like this week. So for right now, as far as we can tell, the earliest animal fossils are around 535 million years old. Then we start to get differentiation. This is a fossil of like a coral or some such shit. Okay, so here we have these guys. Then we start to get differentiation in plants as well. Here are early, early plant fossils. This right here is a stem sliced cross section. Here is this growing thing here, right? This branching here. You can tell this is what we call a monocot. It's a very, very early plant. Its vascular bundles are kind of everywhere. Um, this doesn't look like a dicot, like like a, a, a advanced plant would be. You have special ring shapes in here, in these vascular bundles, but <clears throat> anyway, um, here's the earliest plants. Um, by the by, just so you know, plants didn't come up onto land until about 500 million years ago. So think about that, okay? The earth is here for 4.6 billion years. 4.6 billion years. It takes a billion years to start life, right? And from about three and a half billion years, for the next three billion years, we have just shit living in the ocean. The Paleozoic era, right? Paleozoic is when we have like the Cambrian explosion. So all these things living in the ocean. It isn't until 500 million years ago that we get plants crawling up on land, starting to colonize up here. Then we get the Permian. You ever seen one of these guys before? How many of you have bought a dinosaur playset and you have this shithead living in one of those? Raise your hand in the class, right? This is not a dinosaur. This is called the Dimetrodon. Dimetrodons are really cool because they are the first creatures that have different sizes of teeth for doing different things. That's what Dimetrodon means. Dimetrodon, two sizes of tooth, right? So here's Dimetrodon. This is not a dinosaur, he's a stem mammal. This guy is starting to use thermal regulation. This guy is coming close to having warm blood. This guy is more closely related to you than he is to any dinosaur. This guy is a synapsid. Squeeze your cheek right here. And you feel this little thing, this little hole on your temple there. This right here is your synapse that connects here to your post-orbital bar. bar. Diapsids, which are reptiles and birds and stuff, which is even birds and reptiles, doesn't matter. Reptiles, snakes, lizards, birds, tortoises, uh, 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 amphibians, they are diapsids. This guy is a synapsid. He's more closely related to you than any dinosaur. And he's freaking big, too. You know what else lives during the Permian period? Gorgonopsids. Here's a Gorgonopsid skeleton. Imagine a reptilian wolf that's also venomous. That thing right there. They're freaking big. If you can think about this and not shit your pants, tell me how, because I haven't figured it out yet. These guys are horrifying. Will you go back a couple? Go back a couple for what? Yeah. Go back. Go back one more. This one? Yeah, will you stay in front of the projector again? Seeing that on your question everything shirt is fucking sweet. Oh, we might need to make new t-shirts then. <laughs> Visit my merch store, link in bio. <laughs> All right, so here we've got these guys. Then, this is the Permian period. At the end of the Permian period, we have the Great Dying, massive climate change events. 95% of all life on Earth dies off. But this is where we're starting to get mammals during the Permian period. We're starting to get things that are almost like mammals. Almost! Mammals don't evolve until around 220 million years ago. We're going to get there. But right now, we're going to go to the age of the dinosaurs. Yeah! See this picture? This picture's dumb as fuck. Let's talk about why. Take a look at this guy. What's this big dump shit doing in here? That brontosaurus is about 50 million years on the wrong time than these guys. These lived at very different times from this. This brontosaurus wouldn't have been there if this tyrannosaurus was there. Because this is Cretaceous and this is Triassic. This is all ridiculous, okay? Another thing that's wrong with this picture, what the fuck is all this? Look what they're standing on. This is called grass. And grass wasn't around in the dinosaur times, y'all. Grass didn't evolve until around 50 million years ago, 10 to 15 million years after the dinosaurs died. So they would have had trees, they would have had ferns, they would have had plants, but no grass to speak of. 
So if you ever see a dinosaur painting with grass on it, like this dumb one is, you tell them that they're wrong. Be obnoxious, that's what science is all about. So, we've got now the Mesozoic era. Mesozoic literally means middle life, okay? So after the Permian, we have the Mesozoic. This is broken up into the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. This is where we have dinosaurs and dinosaur-related things. And then also, 220... Oh, oh, here's another fun thing to me, okay? You've got... 300, uh, uh, 4.6 billion years, life's on this earth, right? Three billion, three and a half billion years, we get the first uh, uh, life, right? So 4.6 billion years ago, the earth starts. Three and a half billion years ago, life starts. Cut forward three billion years, we now have 500 million years ago, the first land plants. Cut that time in half, and we now have and the dinosaurs happening here. And it's all just evolutionary processes, okay? Remember... Nobody just woke up today and was like, I want to be a dinosaur. Doesn't make sense. Dinosaurs aren't here today. Why? Because, did I cover this? No, we're about to. Okay, sorry, we'll come back to that. Um, 220 million years ago, we get mammals. Okay, for the first 100 million or so years of mammal existence, we would have laid eggs. There are still mammals today that lay eggs. They are called monotremes. We have two species of them, echidnas and platypuses. Um, until around 100 million, 120 million years ago, uh, we have this girl come up here. This is called Aomea. Aomea literally means dawn mother. Um, she lived in China, and this is the first animal with a placenta. So this is the first creature to start giving live birth, which is really, really good, because if you don't lay eggs, that means your babies can cook 100% inside, and you don't have to protect eggs and worry about that, and it's super, duper cool. Lots and lots of benefits to being this. So, these guys pop up, mammals pop up. 220 million years ago, and then catastrophe happens 65 million years ago. Kersplash! This giant asteroid, which is called Chicxulub, by the way, crashes into the Yucatan Peninsula. This is, by the way, why we have this shape of Mexico here, is because that is the impact crater of the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. Fun fact for you. What happened to the dinosaurs? Why aren't there more dinosaurs anymore? Well, there's a couple of reasons. The first of which being that after that asteroid hit, the asteroid itself isn't what killed the dinosaurs. The asteroid killed a bunch of them, for sure. Asteroid wiped out everything in, in, you know, around that area, North South America. But there was also nuclear winter at that time. Like, we would have blotted out the sun. Volcanoes all around the Earth would have erupted. We would have had shards of basically glass, silica, that was raining down on everything. Things would have just chewed on. We actually have fossils um, around this time, where their teeth are so worn down and broken, and their innards are just torn up because they were eating this ash, this glass that was raining down everywhere for a long, long, long time. So, lots and lots of things died out. Mammals, like us, were able to survive, not only because we were so adaptive, but also because we have this cool thing where we regulate our own internal body temperature. Reptiles can't do that. So what happens when you get a fungal infection? Your body fights it off because your body is nice and warm and fungi can't grow in this warm environment. A reptile gets a fungal infection. They have to go hang out in the sun and soak up sunlight to warm their body up to fight off the fungus. That's why they didn't pop back up. They got fungal infections and couldn't fight them off, and we could. This is called the fungal infection mammalian selection hypothesis, and it's really freaking cool to me. Um, another thing is we still have dinosaurs today. What? How could that be the case? Well... Fossil evidence has shown that by the Cretaceous period, fall, uh, dinosaurs were already evolving feathers. Okay? So by the Cretaceous period, we've already got feathers going on. And over the next 65 million years, the avian dinosaurs, which had their feathers and were able to thermoregulate, evolved into birds. Literally every bird in the world is descended from dinosaurs. That's where they come from. Birds are dinosaurs. That's their ancestors. That's all that's left of them. If you eat dinosaur-shaped chicken nuggets, that's like a whole weird thing, right? Because that's literally what they are. And that's what the evidence shows us. Tell How them, freaking cool is that? Tell them where chickens came from. Yeah, so there, there's a common thing to say that uh, uh, the genetics shows that the most close related uh, to the Tyrannosaurus rex is modern chickens. So chickens are T-Rexes. There's some debate in there as to whether or not that's... It's, it's like when we say that humans are like 98% chimpanzee. It's kind of a generalization, but it's a fun thing to think about. <laughs> it's, it's, it, yeah. 
So that's how, that's where the dinosaurs went off to. We still have dinosaurs today, they're called birds. You wonder why things like hawks and falcons and eagles are called raptors? Because they're literally motherfucking raptors is why. That's what it's all about. That's where they evolved from. Um, so, now, we've got the dinosaurs <clears throat> wiped out. Mammals take over. 65 million years ago, we already covered this. Here's a plesiodapiform fossil. Okay? Plesiodapiforms. These are the first. This one, I believe, is Darwinius massili. Um, these plesiodapiforms are the beginnings of the uh, primates. Why are they primates and not just squirrels? Because they have fingernails instead of claws and opposable thumbs. How awesome is that? Then we skip forward to about 12 million years ago when the apes start splitting up. So here we have our break with orangutans, here we have a break with gorillas, here we have our break with chimpanzees, and here we said again, your cyclanthropus, oran, artifithicus, australopithecus, and then going on to us. And then the best part, right? We're talking about billions of years of evolution so far. We cut forward through all the rest of this. Now, to 200,000 years ago, 200,000 years ago on the plains of Africa, this species pops up. You get it, like... I picked this picture because these are the Kyogen Sands Bushmen, the sand, the sand people. Um, S-A-N, not sand, like the gravel, sand, S-A-N. These are the Kyogen Sand people. They have some of the oldest genetics in, out of all humans. So cool. Here they are hanging out with some ostrich eggs. These guys are fucking awesome. Humans are super weird. This species is insane. Okay? What do they got going on for them? Well, number one, they've got eyes facing forward in the front of their head. Because they are hunters. They are predators. Right? They have all sorts of different shapes and sizes that they come in. They gather in groups and work together. Except for when there's a goddamn pandemic going on. Then they, they, the good ones stay home, and lots of them like to fight over nonsense. They do something that's very unique. They teach their young. They work with their offspring. They don't just go completely off of instinct. They teach their offspring new knowledge that they could not have gained on their own. Okay? And because of that, over the next 100,000 to 150,000 years... This species of ape develops agriculture, develops art, develops writing, and develops a striking sense of self. By the way, we have cave paintings like this that are older than our species, that other species of humans did. And while they're doing this, they spread out of Africa across the whole world. And while doing so, they develop a myriad of incredible, striking cultures and a rainbow of skin colors. Why? Why do we develop this? Okay. So, I'm going to actually take a breather here and let's do questions really quick. Um, so, we just covered a brief history of all life on Earth, um, and we got now to where humans have just evolved 200,000 years ago. Before I tell you where skin colors come from and things like that, let's take a second, 30 second break. Are there any specific questions about just those things that I just talked about, about how these different species evolved, where humans come from? I know we covered that a lot a little bit ago, so I won't, I don't want to backtrack, but like anything specifically about what we just covered. How did people get to Australia or Hawaii? Really cool question. Um, okay, so we go back here. How did people get to Australia, Hawaii, all these places, right? What you have to remember is that we evolved here during the Pleistocene 200,000 years ago. This is during the Ice Age, okay? So when the Earth is very cold, water is consolidated in glaciers. This is not just like making ice cubes in the ocean. This is taking water up out of the ocean. So the oceans were much, much lower. And so humans got to Australia around 40,000 years ago because all of Indonesia, you would have been able to just walk straight across. Okay? You just walk right down through here. <clears throat> Excuse me. The same thing here. We got into America 
because we were able to walk across this is called the Bering Strait, and during this time there would have been a land bridge that we were able to just walk right across. These land bridges are still here. We can still see them. They're just underwater. So that's how we get to these different places. Now Hawaii and all these areas out here in the Pacific Islands, these are different. These happened much, much, much more recently with Polynesians are the fucking coolest because they were able to like seriously just map out the stars and just know where they were going and just island hop like crazy. Um, it's so radical that we still to this day, because you know we genocided the shit out of them, we still don't know exactly how they pulled it off. But some explorers have actually been able to go back and use only the methods that survived and still like circumnavigate the globe. They are that effective. Absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. Oh, so, way away. Yeah. Wait, we set a course to find a brand new island, island everywhere, everywhere we roam. Ah, oh, it's such a good thing. So. This is how we spread around the world. Other questions? Um, sorry, I have to scroll back. No, you're fine. Um, someone asked if there was a mass extinction of bacteria, how come mm -hmm. we still have bacteria? <clears throat> they didn't all die. There's been five different mass extinctions throughout Earth's history. Five different mass extinctions. Um, so, when this happens, we lose a lot of life, but the life that is left over then diversifies. Okay? So it's what we call a bottleneck event. You've got lots and lots and lots of genetic diversity. Remember earlier on we were talking about genetic diversity and how we could have these different types of selection, directional selection, stabilizing selection, disruptive selection. When you have a bottleneck event, like a, a mass extinction, you just chop off a huge amount of that graph. You just take off a massive part of that genetic diversity. And then what's left is able to spread out. Sometimes they might go back and do the same things that were going on before, but more likely they're going to radiate into totally new niches, totally new ways of living, based off of what was there. Um, Suzette wants to know, are crocodiles and alligators modern dinosaurs? Phenomenal question. Yes. Well, yes and no. So, crocodiles, alligators, caimans, all these crocodilians, right? They have been around since the Mesozoic era. They're really, they're, their bodies haven't changed very much over the last 200 million years. So lots of people like to say they're modern dinosaurs. The thing is, you actually have two different branches here. You have the Archaeosaurs, which are the dinosaurs, and then you have like the Pseudosuchians, which were the crocodiles and the alligators and things. At the beginning of the Mesozoic era, 250 million years ago, um, we had Pangaea going on, so all of the Earth's land masses rolled together. Um, because of that, there wasn't a lot of weather going on in the middle. It would have been a desert for most of Pangaea, and then around the outsides is where it would have been swampy goodness. Um, so the Pseudosuchians were doing really fine here. Then we have this thing called the Carnian Pluvial Event. Carnian Pluvial Episode, episode, not event, sorry. The Carnian Pluvial Episode was that one time when it rained for like two million years. Massive climate change events, probably due to volcanoes. Um, made the earth much, much, like at this time, we're talking about an earth where the ocean is like the, the temperature of a hot tub. Like it's hot, right? Massive climate change event, all of a sudden starts raining like crazy. Rainfall skyrockets, like rain levels just go through the roof and all of Pangaea gets soaked. Because of this, the archaeosaurs, which are way better at moving, their legs are directly beneath their body, they're not all sprawled out like a crocodile, they're better at breathing, they have way better lungs, the Archaeosaurs take over, Pseudosuchians die off. Where did they die off to? There's three lineages, crocodiles, alligators, and caimans, which are really good at living in swamps, and that's all they do. That is all they do. For the next 200 million years, they don't diversify, they don't change, they are good at what they are good at, and that is what they do. Meanwhile, the Archaeosaurs diversify into a tremendous amount of different things. They learn you know, you, you, all sorts of things from pterosaurs to, to, to brontosaurs to stegosaurs to, to tyrannosaurs not all of those are directly related but whatever um a massive diversification of lizards at this time um that's very 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 different from what the uh, what the, the the crocodilians did so crocodilians they are as old as dinosaurs they themselves are not really dinosaurs so it's kind of a tricky little business in there um but yeah i hope that helps is there another question, Betty? Uh, yeah, this is a little off topic, but um, can you talk about lemurs and why they're different and where they're found? Yeah, so when you've got, you look at primate evolution, okay? When you look at primate evolution, you've got different branches, okay? You've got, let's draw this again. 
Okay. So here's up here. Here's humans. Up there. Here's chimps. Here's bonobos. Here's gorillas. Here's orangutans. Lemurs and tarsiers would be down here. Okay? Is that all in frame? Can you see all that? Yes. Okay? So these guys are what we call pro simians, literally means before monkeys. So you've got here, lemurs and tarsiers, monkeys and things are actually going to break off. Oops, the pen's not working at that angle. Monkeys are going to break off from here, and you're going to have old world monkeys and new world monkeys. That's not right. That's actually going to be really misleading. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That, that would confuse more people if I drew it that way. This whole branch here, this branch here is monkeys. From here, we branch off and get new world monkeys. If that makes sense, that should be a little bit easier. Okay, so this is where lemurs fall in. They are pro simians. Um, one cool thing about lemurs is that they are structurized, which means they have um, like a dog nose on the front. They have a, a, a wet, hard nose. They have this thing called a rhinarium on the front for smelling. Everything else on this list here, we go up and talk about these other monkeys and then apes and things like that. Apes and whatnot are haplorines. And from the haplorines, you have the cachyrines and the some other kind of rind. It's all different kinds of noses. And that's old world versus new world monkeys. So lemurs are actually older than monkeys, if that makes any sense. Um, I should also point out that like events like that, where we have one kind of thing that becomes a totally different kind of thing, that's really, really common. So take, for example, we have the same type of cladogram here, the same kind of chart for fish, right? Say fish. Here we have Actinopterygian fish. Actinopterygian fish are ray fin fishes. Think of a fish. It's probably Actinopterygian. Clownfish and all these other things. Go back a little bit earlier, you have chondrichthian fish. Those are sharks and rays and things. All up here, you have um, sarcopterygian fishes, lobe fin fishes. Lobe fin fishes have big, meaty fins. They don't have the little delicate tendrils that a lot of other fish have. Lobe fin fishes still exist today, but some lobe fin fishes broke off to become the first tetrapods. Okay? You go back to the end of the Devonian period. Let me grab this guy. Ugh. You go back to the end of the Devonian period, you see an animal like this called Tiktaalik. He's a lobe-finned fish with a lot of amphibian features. This guy was able to push himself up with his fins and get up out of the water. Fish have been breathing air for a long time. They go up to the surface and gulp. Gulp air. Whenever they're in low oxygen-rich water, fish today will do this. They'll go up and gulp oxygen out of the air. They can't do it long term because their gills aren't evolved for that, right? But when in the Devonian period we had things like Tiktaalik swimming around, we had fish that developed lungs. Now that's super cool to think about, but what's even cooler to think about is that these fish develop lungs. Lots of fish kept the lungs and used the lungs to be better fish. Lots of fish kept the lungs and converted the lungs into swim bladders. Swim bladders are modified lungs, not the other way around. Right? So these fish that develop lungs crawl up out of the water. We get the first tetrapods. Some Sarcopterygian fish still exist today. So here we have all fish, chondrichthians like sharks and rays. We didn't come from sharks, but sharks and us share an ancestor. Actinopterygian fish. We didn't come from clownfish, but we and clownfish share a common ancestor. Sarcopterygian fish. We did come from Sarcopterygian fish. And there are still Sarcopterygian fish today. Am I from a coilacanth, the, the coelacanth fish? Is that me? No. But we share a common ancestor that was also a fish. Here's another thing to think about. Is that when you talk about cladograms, when you talk about the way we define things, right, you have these different branches here, where you have fish here, right? And birds here and reptiles here. That's not how it works. We have branches coming off of branches. So what it is, actually I'll just read the whole damn thing. So what it is, is you've got fish here at the base 
Some of these fish stayed fish, more fish. Some of them went on to become amphibians. Here's amphibians here. Some of them stayed amphibians. Some of those amphibians went on to become like reptilian creatures. Some of them stayed reptilian creatures. Some of them went on to do mammal stuff. Some of them are still mammals, right? So we're not talking about like how these things are all super different. They come from one another. Humans are not the pinnacle of evolutionary progress. Humans are a weird side branch of fish. We're all fucking fish. Everything's a fish, except for bacteria. Those aren't fish. All right, so here's what we're talking about. Um, and I see somebody saying, are we seriously related to bananas? I'm going to make this very simple. I'm not trying to condescend or talk down to you. I'm not trying to be condescending. Condescending is when you talk to someone like they're stupid. Sorry. I'm <laughs> just playing. So just very, very simple here, okay? Literally everything that is alive is literally related to everything else that is alive. Every living thing on this planet that ever was or currently is are literally related to each other. Okay? And when you look back across our timeline, let me grab this. When we look back across the history of our evolution, okay? Here we've got life down here at the bottom starting. Here we have the animal kingdom here. Here we have the first vertebrates. Here we have that break that I talked about with different fish. Here's the Actinopterygian fish. Here's the Sarcopterygian fish, which still exists today. Here we get up into the tetrapods. Reptiles go this way. Here we have the break off from synapsids. Remember we talked about Dimetrodon, right? Here's the birds coming out of the reptiles. Here's Dimetrodon synapsids coming along make mammals. Here's the egg-laying mammals that still live today. Here's the non-placental mammals like the marsupials that still live today. Here's the placental mammals that branch out into all of us mammals here. And we humans are right up here on this stretch here. Okay? You go back and you can say, here's all these humans and lemurs and monkeys and apes. They're all primates, right? They all go back to this primate section. So all these things above this break are primates. You go back here. All these things, cows and, 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 and donkeys and skunks and raccoons and, and hedgehogs and whales, all of this that comes after this break, all of these are mammals, right? This is all mammals here. You go back further, here we have tetrapods, four-limbed creatures. Reptiles came out of that. Birds came out of that. Mammals came out of that. Everything above this break is a tetrapod. You go back further, and you have the very first vertebrates. Everything above this break is a vertebrate. But what else is on this break? Fish. Sarcopterygian fish. Fish is what we call a paraphyletic group. You have different types of groups. A monophyletic group is one organism and all of their ancestors all together. Okay? Humans are a monophyletic group, kind of. Right? We're talking about everything from Homo habilis to us. Everything included. A polyphyletic group includes some of these over here and some of these over here. Totally different, but they, we're going to group them together the same way. Eels are a polyphyletic group. Not all eels share a common ancestor. Not all eels are even actually eels. We just call them eels because they're long-ass fish. Wolf eels, for example, aren't actually eels. They're just long-ass fish that we call eels. Okay? Eels, totally different thing. Paraphyletic group is one organism, some of their ancestors, but not all of them. Fish are paraphyletic. Why? Because some fish became cows and humans and dogs and birds and squirrels and lizards and everything else. If we were going to define fish as a monophyletic group, you'd have to include humans as fish. Got it? So you can say, strictly speaking, that you're a fish, uh, but you would be misclassifying yourself, but it's fun to do anyway. So there's some information for you. Okay? Put this poster back. Yeah. I'm just going to put it over here. 
I do want to say really quickly to the girl who keeps asking, is it too far-fetched to believe in mermaids? Uh, yes, we have no fossils, we have no specimens, dead or alive, to suggest that that was a creature that ever existed in the past or exists today. Right, so the question is, could mermaids exist? Absolutely, that is a thing that could have evolved. Mammals have evolved into the ocean before. Where do whales come from? Whales are more closely related to cows than they are to fish. They were land animals that slowly, over the course of millions of years, evolved back into the water. Whales still have leg bones that are just tucked up inside that you can't see. Right? So, whales are mammals that went back in the water. Could humans have done the same thing? Absolutely. If humans have just been in the water for millions and millions and millions of years, in fact, there are still human populations today that have ridiculously large spleens because they're populations of people that swim and dive and they are actually evolving to be able to like survive underwater for way, way, way longer. If we stuck to that and slowly started getting less legs and started getting flippers and all this stuff, that could happen, but it hasn't. We have no fossil evidence of this. We have no record of anything like this. We have no evidence to suggest that that's the case. So is mermaids and things like this is possible? Sure, in a different world, but not this one. <laughs> not this one. For all the people asking, we found this poster at UsefulCharts.com. UsefulCharts.com. They sell that poster. Really, really, really cool one. Okay. Let's move on to the evolution of skin color. So, we talked about a minute ago how humans come in a variety, oops, in a variety of different colors, right? All these different colors. Where do these colors come from? Humans evolved in Africa 200,000 years ago. The very first humans were black. They have black skin. Why is that? Your skin contains a chemical called melanin. Now, there's different kinds of melanin, okay? There's pheomelanin and eumelanin. Pheomelanin is what gives you red hair and freckles. Eumelanin is for everything else, okay? In, uh, actually, I have a picture, I think. Yes. There we go. Here's pheomelanin and eumelanin. There. Different types of it. So, what happens when you're a human and you're getting hit by the sun all the time? Well, you can get sun damage, skin burn, skin cancers, things like that. That is not why we evolved dark skin. Okay? The reason we evolved dark skin is because if you've ever been pregnant or know anybody who's been pregnant, you know that when you're pregnant, you take folic acid. Okay? Folic acid, right here. That's folic acid. Why do you do this? Because without enough folic acid in your body, when you're pregnant, when your baby's developing, your baby will be born with horrible spinal deformities like this one, it's called spina bifida. The spinal cord loops up out of the spine. This baby will almost certainly be paralyzed from the waist down and will never walk. Okay? That's why you take folic acid supplements. UV light from the sun, which is what gives you sunburn, also destroys folic acid in your body. So the very first humans were black because we needed that melanin to protect us from UV light. This is why black people have a hard time getting a sunburn. It can still happen, but it's much, much, much less likely because you have so much melanin, which the whole job of melanin is to block out UV light, which is what gives you sunburn and destroys folic acid. You got dark skin so you could have healthy babies. Okay? This is why humans develop dark skin first. So here we have this rainbow of dark colors, this beautiful skin that is there to protect your babies. How fucking awesome is that? How gorgeous is that? Now, there's another thing that happened. Remember I said humans spread all over the world, right? My ancestors, you notice that I'm as white as the day is long, went way up north where there isn't a lot of direct sunlight. Remember, the Earth's at an angle. The sun's going to hit the center, the equator of the Earth, way, way more. That's why it's hot there. So people like me, way up north, we're not getting a lot of sunlight. There's not a lot of vitamin D in the grain. That's a problem. Because UV light, as well as giving you sunburn, it produces vitamin D in your body. Vitamin D. Vitamin D is not actually a vitamin. It's actually a hormone. It means it does signaling, cell signaling in your body. Um, Vitamin D is really important for a lot of things, not the least of which it helps you produce melatonin, helps you go to sleep. It also produces um, antidepressants. It makes you happy. Um, but most importantly, it gives you strong bones. If you have a vitamin D deficiency, you're going to get rickets. 
Here's what rickets look like. Just really, really rubbery, screwed up bones. Okay? Once again, these children are not going to live on the plains of the savannah. These people children are not going to survive in the wild. Okay? So we got lighter skin so we could absorb more sunlight so that we could have healthy, strong bones. And here we have now all these shades of white that pop up. In case you didn't know what white people look like. Here they are. And every other racial characteristic that you can think of has an evolutionary history. We develop a rainbow of skin colors and shapes and patterns and styles because we had to live in different areas. A couple of takeaways from this. Number one is that if you're a racist, you are angry about 100,000-year-old sunburns. Get the fuck over it. Dumb as shit. Uh, and the second thing is that now we actually see takeaways from this today. Dark-skinned people that live up north need to take vitamin D supplements to stay healthy and stay happy. People like me who live down south, we need to wear sunscreen to protect our skin. We need to take folic acid supplements, right? So this here is just evolution. There are no subspecies of humans, right? There is not a special breed of humans for black, white, Mexican, Asian, name it, whatever. We are all one species. We all come from Africa. The very first humans were black, and then we spread out from there. Okay? So, nobody's more evolved. Remember what I talked about a minute ago? Every single thing that is currently alive is the same level of evolved. White people are not more evolved. Black people are not more evolved. Asian people are not more evolved. None of that makes any goddamn sense. We are all the same species. We are all homo sapiens with surface level differences, which are just for the survival mainly of children. Surface level differences. Race is not a real thing. There is no such thing, biologically speaking, as race. Why? Few things. Number one, you need to remember, actually, let me grab this over here so I can actually break these things down pretty succinctly. See if I have. Oh, goodness. Here we go. Yes. Yes. So. First of all, we covered how evolution, not races and all these things, explains human variation. Another thing we need to know is that human variation is continuous. It's continuous. That means that there isn't a single point, just like when we were talking about different species, there isn't a single point where you can say, this is definitely this species, right? Can't do that. There's not a single point where you say, okay, this is definitely a black person and this is definitely a white person. A white person. These races are continuous. You can have, you know... Pick whatever characteristic you want to stick to. Black hair and, and white eyes and Asian nose or whatever. These are continuous. They're not exclusive. Right? They're not exclusive. Um, another thing is that there's actually more genetic diversity within what you might call a race than there is between them. Okay? So what you might identify as a white person, there's a huge amount of variation there. And the line between one thing to the other is completely arbitrary. Okay? Completely arbitrary. It's not, it's not a real thing. Mm. Oh, God. I'm so thirsty. And another thing you need to know is that there is no set way to classify what a race is. There was actually a study done by, I believe, Stanford not too long ago where they took all the genetic variation of humans, put it into a computer system. And they said, hey, cute computer, if we were to classify this into two races, what would it be? And it came up with this one split. Um, I can't remember. I think it was like East Asia and everything else. And they said, okay, what about two different races? Or, th or three. And it was like Africa, East Asia, everybody else. What about four races? South America is different now. This is different now. And by the time they got to like six, seven races, it was like, even by the time they had like five races, it was like, okay, the people on just this one island are a race and everybody else is different. And so like, it became more and more and more arbitrary with fewer and fewer and fewer people to the point where it was having to divide up the races that it had made to make new races. It's just, they're ridiculous arbitrary lines that even when you, when you actually have a computer program doing it for you, don't make any goddamn sense. So certainly when we do it, it's going to make less sense. It's completely just 
ridiculous and niche and made up and they're arbitrary ridiculous lines where this does count and that doesn't count but they're the same thing but who cares and this person's black is going to be a different person's different kind of dark bright white light whatever like it's all just nonsense so there's no such thing as race scientifically we are all human beings we've been on this planet for 200,000 years the physical superficial differences that you see are not like enough to classify humans differently it's just not. It's just not. So, that out of the way, let me tell you about some other things. One fun thing that's really cool to know is that psychological studies have shown that when people go through trials together, when we go through difficult events together, we tend to bond and come out together closer, like a family. So when you struggle through tribulations with different people, you feel connected to them. So let me give you some tribulations that humans have been through. So you can feel connected to literally everybody, okay? We evolved during the Pleistocene, during the Ice Age, okay? What was around during the Pleistocene besides humans? This thing here. I almost said a lot of curse words, and I'm trying to cut back. This is Arctotus. Arctotus, the short-faced bear. This lived, this, this human here is about my height. This is about six feet, a little over six feet tall. I'm six foot two. This guy's about 1.8 centimeters, or 1.8 meters tall. Here's the skull of Arctotus. This is a grizzly bear skull. You could put this in this thing's mouth without even trying. So Arctotus, the short-faced bear, this was alive when we evolved, and we dealt with this. This lived here in North America. Here's another one. Titanus Wallery, the terror bird. Here's one of its skulls being held in the hands of an adult human. This monstrosity lived at the same time as us. What else existed at the same time as us? Go over to China and you've got Gigantopithecus Blackie, the largest ape that ever lived. You want to talk about Sasquatch bitches? Look at this thing's head. This is a human. This is an adult male gorilla. This is Gigantopithecus. You could fit your whole skull in this thing's eye socket. Here's my favorite one that lived while we lived. Megatherium. The giant ground sloth. Look at that thing! Look at that skeleton! Girl! Here's a fun fact for you, by the way. Here in the Americas, we have these delicious fruits called avocados. Megatherian, uh, the giant ground sloth, was essential for this avocado because they would eat them whole and poop out the seeds. Because the megatherians are freaking giants, right? So they would eat these avocados, crap out avocado seeds, that's how avocados grew. When humans came to the Americas at the end of the Pleistocene, these megatherians were dying off. But we like avocados, and we're one of the only animals that can eat them. Avocados are very poisonous to most things. Um, if you give avocado to a pig or to a parrot, you will kill them very quickly. But, like, we can eat avocados. So we like them. So we started harvesting and growing avocados, and then Megatherium died off. Humans are the only reasons avocados exist today. We are the only... Without humans, avocados go extinct. Because Megatherium's dead. Fun fact for you. We, humans, this weird, mostly hairless species of ape, went from the Ice Age, fighting through Arctotus, and Titanus, and Gigantopithecus, and Megatherium. We survived through all of this insanity. And what did we do next? We flung ourselves out off of this planet and flung our machines out into interplanetary space. That, by the way, is the Voyager. The Voyager spacecraft were launched in, uh, in 1990, I believe. This one particular, 19, uh, late 1980s, early 1990s. Um, and Voyager, his whole job, this probe's whole job, 
is to go out, it has a plate, a big record on it, with a bunch of information about Earth. And hopefully, an alien will find it someday and find us. That's basically all it's for. But it also had a camera on it. And it took pictures and sent those pictures back home. And on February 4th, 1990, when the Voyager was out past Saturn, it took this picture. See that? You notice anything particularly special about that picture? Let me zoom in a little bit more. See anything now? These streaks that you're seeing here, these are streaks of sunlight in the camera lens. See anything? Zoom in more. See anything? See that? Right there? That little slightly lighter area? Right there? Zoom out again. Can you still see it? That dot right there is Earth. You can't even freaking see it, barely. You see that little dot? That's the Earth right there. I want you to look at that. I want you to seriously take a second to look at that and think about this with me. That little dot right there is where you live, where your family lives, where every single superstar you've ever heard of has lived, where every single dictator that destroyed civilizations has ever lived, where every single homeless person on the street, every young couple in love, every hopeful child, every single person you have ever heard of lived on that speck of dust floating in a sunbeam. Every one of them. Everybody lived and died right there. Think about, I'm quoting Carl Sagan as best I can, think about the rivers of blood that have been spilled so that in glory and triumph, some great person can own a fraction of that dot. Think about the people who live on one corner of that pixel who hate the people who live on the other corner of that pixel. When you look at this picture, when you look at this dot, all of that melts away. This picture reminded Carl Sagan, reminds me, and I hope reminds you to deal more kindly with each other. Because what you don't see in this picture is anybody else. Nothing here to help us, to save us, to take care of us, to protect us. Nothing but this one speck of dust and the monkeys that live on it. This is why we have to take care of where we live. This is why we have to take care of each other. Because we are one species living on this one planet, and we have one chance to get this right, because if we fuck it up, there's nothing else for us to go to. Can we visit other planets? Maybe in the near future. Can we settle on other planets? Not even close. We're able to know this, and we're able to do these amazing things, from surviving the Ice Age, to going to space, to doing all these other things, because we come equipped with the coolest thing the coolest thing to ever evolve. And that is this. The human brain. This is a very well-preserved brain. Here's one that's fresh out of dude. A little bit more squishy. This three-pound lump of jelly, about the consistency of raw mushroom, kind of squishy to the touch. If you ever get the chance to hold a human brain legally, do it. I've done it several times. Because this three pound blob is where a person feels, thinks, dreams, loves, everything. This mass of neurons, so incredibly simple and so incredibly, incredibly fragile, is capable of comprehending and calculating the vastness of interstellar space. This thing 
here is the reason why I've been able to talk to you for three hours about the history of the entire goddamn universe. Take care of this. Use this. Because the brain is a tool, just like any other tool. If I have a hammer, I can either build a house or I can beat somebody over the head. It's just a tool. It does a thing, whatever you tell it to do. Brain, too, is a tool. You can use it to learn about this universe. You can learn it, use it to learn about people around you. You can use it to take care of your fellow men and women and children and everybody else. You can use this to make this whole place better. Or you can use this to be a selfish piece of trash. The choice is yours. But this is the coolest thing that I know to exist in this universe. I've studied them for a long time. They're awesome. Take care of yours. And please, please, by Darwin's beard, use it. Use it every day, as often as you can, and as many ways as you can. Stretch it out. Take it for walks. It's up to you to do so. Nobody else is going to do it for you. Okay. We have covered a lot. We've covered a lot. Um, before we wrap up, does anybody have any questions about specifically human history, human brains, the things we just talked about? Just, just that. Just this last section. Does anybody have any questions about this last section of stuff that we just covered? Someone's telling you to stop talking about racism, racism. No. Someone's, okay, so in case you didn't hear, someone's telling me to stop talking about racism, racism. No. I dare you. I dare you to find any problem in this world that you think will go away by just not talking about it. No. Races do not exist. Racism does. Racists exist. Races do not. And because racists exist, we need to talk about it. Because we need people to understand, when I was a kid, I was taught that race is a very real thing, but you shouldn't talk about it. Just don't bring it up. The opposite is true. Race is not a real thing, but it is very important, and we do need to talk about it. Because culture exists, history exists, food exists, religion exists, music exists. So many different things exist that are important and beautiful and wonderful and interesting to talk about. But unfortunately... So do dumb motherfuckers who think that someone's skin color classifies, you know, how valuable they are. Let me make this very clear as well while I'm here. If you're the type of person who thinks that you're better than anybody else because of where you were born or what you were born, you're a fucking idiot. Plain and simple. Dumb. You're dumb. I have no use for you. If anybody in the chat right now is listening and they're like, Oh, but I thought I'm special because I'm never do. Dumb. Real dumb. Get off my channel. I make money when you people watch my videos. If you're a racist piece of trash, I don't want to make money from you. Ban me. Eat a thousand dicks and ban me. Okay. Uh, so no, I will not stop talking about race. Fuck you. Uh, other thing, maybe? Are there any other good questions? And the chat's going real fast, but I don't, I don't think so. Okay, cool. Um, so we'll wrap up then. Uh, we've been going for about three hours. Um, so we've covered a lot. Oh, and by the way, there are some smooth brains out there that want to say that you can use evolution to prove racism is bullshit and that eugenics and is all a good idea and that, you know, social Darwinism. Uh, Darwin himself was exposed to racism. He saw a lot of slavery while he was traveling the world, and he hated it. He said that the fact that humans all share a common ancestor, that we all evolved, that we're all one species, should be reason enough to say that this racist bullshit is wrong. I'm not saying Darwin was right about everything. He got some stuff wrong. Also, we don't worship Darwin like he was just a dude. But the whole social Darwinism has nothing to do with actual Darwinism, just so you know. This whole eugenics bullshit has nothing to do with actual evolutionary science. It is monsters using science for monstrous means. You can, like I said, these are tools. You can use uranium to make power plants and party balloons. Or you can use uranium to make a nuclear bomb. It depends on whether you're a piece of shit or not. So if you're going to run with evolution and be like, Aha, so white people should dominate Lubidu. You're a dumbass. You're not actually using science. You're just being shit. So we covered 
what science is and how it works. We covered what a theory is. We covered the Big Bang. We covered stellar genesis, nuclear synthesis, stars, planets, how the oceans got salty, how the Earth got in the atmosphere. We talked about abiogenesis, the formation of macromolecules, the RNA world hypothesis. We talked about cyanobacteria, oxygen, mass extinctions, cellular respiration, photosynthesis, endosymbiosis. We talked about the first plants, first animals. We talked about how evolution works. We talked about selection pressures, different types of speciation. We talked about the different areas of time from the Paleozoic all the way up to the Cenozoic, which is the age we're living in now. And we talked about why humans are awesome and why races don't exist. I hope that in this time you've learned something. Uh, because I've been talking for now over three hours, and <clears throat> I'm very tired. I'm going to have a cup of tea and um, relax for a little while. Um, if you have questions, uh, I, I will try to, I'll stick around for a couple of seconds to see if I can answer a couple of them, um, but then I'm going to sign off, and I'm going to try to post this to my YouTube channel. Um, we TikTok's kind of weird about the live streams, that it does save and doesn't save, and if the quality is any kind of good, if it's saved and if the quality is good, I will put this up on my YouTube channel ASAP, like hopefully by tomorrow. What is your YouTube um, channel? What is my YouTube channel? It's just Forrest Valkyrie, it's just my name. The link to my YouTube channel is in my bio. In the bio on TikTok here, it's got a link. You can click on that. You can see my YouTube. You can see my Instagram, Facebook page, um, uh, my Patreon and Venmo and Cash App and PayPal are also on there. And the merch store, you can buy this shirt and many other delicious t-shirts like it. Um, it's all there. And if you enjoyed talking about the pale blue dot, talking about that picture of Earth from very, very far away, um, that's linked there too. Go, there's like 600 people watching. I want all of you, even if you're not going to go to all my other socials and you're not going to go to my merch store and all that other stuff, I would still really appreciate it if you would click that link in my bio and scroll to the bottom of the page and you'll see a little alien popping up over the bottom. Please click on that alien. I'm asking, there's 598 people on my side here. I'm asking every single one of you, please, Click the link in my bio and click on that alien and you can read the actual words of Carl Sagan and then there's a picture you can show to everybody else and help people understand. Um, it would really I don't know. It costs you nothing. I make no money when you do it. I don't even know that you do it. But it means a lot to me when you do. So please go click on that alien and, and look at that um, and enjoy it. And while you're there, if you want to subscribe to my YouTube channel, that'd be radical. Um, if you want to buy a t-shirt, if you want to send me a donation on Cash App, that'd be cool. But don't. If you can't, it's no big deal. I appreciate you being here. That's all that matters. Um, does anybody have any big questions really quick before we wrap up? Just a lot of ones you've already answered. Okay, cool. Cool. Um, I'm going to see... If you came in late and you don't know if he has answered it, uh, we will do our best to put the video up. Yep. Um, I see a few kind of there. Uh... Humans have become too evolved to our own demise. Not if we're smart. Not if we pay attention and, and take care of each other. Uh, what is the quiz? Life. Life is the test. Everything is the test. Um, how do human nails and hair get so long? It, it's all because of um, different follicles for your hair are programmed to uh, produce different amounts and keep going for different lengths of time. So it all depends. They want to know when's your next stream. Next live stream is on Sunday. We do Science Sunday every every Sunday, and we just do like Q and A. And then next Sunday, I'm having Dr. Bri Bren or Brian. I can't remember his name exactly, but he's a neuroscientist. We're gonna have him on. Um, souls are this Sunday. no, it's next Sunday. Yeah, next Sunday. This Sunday, we're just doing Q and A. Um, souls or consciousness from a scientific perspective. Consciousness is just neurochemical activity in your brain. That's all it is. Souls, we have no evidence for that. Um, see here. Uh, Einstein didn't work on the theory of everything. He worked on um, uh, uh, relativity. That was what he was famous for. He did other stuff too, but that's, that's the one. Um, science fact that everybody should know is what I just covered, that races don't exist. Everybody should know that. Um, how would we evolve on other planets? Uh, it depends on the selection pressure on those planets. If you have a lot of gravity or less gravity or more or less of this and that and the other, it'll all divide. I can't tell you exactly how we would evolve. It all depends on what that planet looks like. Someone just said, I love you. She doesn't deserve you. I don't. You're very correct. I don't deserve her. You haven't met me. Like, I don't deserve her. Um, uh, let's see here. 42 is the answer. What is the question? Haven't figured it out yet. It's large part fast. Still working on it. Um, uh, why did noses evolve so differently? So, like, that all has to do with the kind of air that we're breathing. So, like, if you're in a very hot, dry environment, you get a flat nose. You don't really need very much. Me, in a very cold environment, I get a big... Crazy nose for warming up air as it goes into my face. Um, 
YouTube, uh, again, it's linked in my bio. Just go to my bio, you can find it, or just Google Renegade Science Teacher or uh, Forrest Valkai is my name. You'll find it there as well. I just did a couple of reaction videos to some anti-evolution anti stuff. So that's a lot of fun. Um, go to sleep. Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> the, let's see here. Uh, why are men the only ones with beards? It all comes down to hormones. That's it, not only men grow beards, not all men grow beards, and some women do too. It always comes down to hormones telling your cells what to do. Um, and the kind of hormones that you have and how those hormones are expressed all comes down to genetics. Um, you don't use 10% of your brain, you use your full brain. Yeah, that's not that. true. Yeah, you, the, the whole 10% of your brain thing isn't true either. Um, uh, see here. I saw somebody say, are you religious? Very no. Very no. Um, intelligent life in space, we have no evidence for it, but surely life exists somewhere, but we talked about that earlier on. Um, does gender exist? Gender is a social construct. So different spe different animals have sexes, you know, sexes, but sex, gender, and sexual orientation are three completely different things. Not one of them is really a binary. Um, biologically speaking, uh, gender just isn't a thing. It's just a social... It's, gender is the way that we, as a society, express our biological sex and what we think that means. It varies from generation to generation, it varies from culture to culture, it varies from person to person. It's not a real thing. Um, don't be religious. Don't be religious. I like that. Um, don't be religious. Don't be religious. I should make that a thing someday. Oh, that'd be so good. Um, uh, and what else? What else? What else? Uh, what does spleen have to do with underwater diving? It's how your, your blood's regulated. Uh, a lot of, there's, there's a lot there. I, I can't, I can't answer that very fast. Um, uh, high IQs, People who brag about their IQs are losers. Um, IQ doesn't mean anything. IQ tests, all an IQ test tells you is how good you are at taking IQ tests. That's all it is. IQ tests are very flawed in a lot of different ways. Um, sometimes they're actually kind of racist because they don't actually predict intelligence whatsoever. They just predict how good you are at taking this test that somebody came up with and so how well you think like that person. Same thing um, with personality tests. Yeah, the whole personality if, test if things. You're an INTJ. Those are all bullshit too. It's not a thing. Those are all bullshit too. Um, do I believe in an omnipotent being? There's no evidence to suggest that that's true. And if such a thing does exist, I don't want anything to do with it. Because anything that has all the power in the universe and leaves the universe like this is a deadbeat monster. Do I believe in aliens? Again, like I said, of course the universe is huge. There must be other life out there. But we have no evidence to say where it is, what it is, what it looks like. There's certainly not anything here. Um, what about star signs? No, astrology is a pseudoscience as well. It makes no sense. There's no evidence to back it up. Um, uh, anyway, I'm going to go make food and then lay down uh, and get a cup of tea and relax for the day. Thank you so much for tuning in and for listening. I hope you learned something. Um, like I said, I'm going to try to post this on YouTube. Have an awesome rest of your day. Please please go to the link in my bio and click on that alien. It costs nothing. I don't even know that you did it, but it would mean a lot to me if you did. And while you're there, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel and all that stuff too. Have an awesome rest of your day uh, and never, ever stop learning. See you later, guys. Bye-bye. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Give it a few seconds because it takes a while. Oh, thank you so much for the flowers. It's very kind. Right. Why don't you stop sending things? I'll end it when you stop sending me things. TikTok keeps 70% of those things that you send. It's so rude. Oh, I don't, I shouldn't say that. It sounds like I'm ungrateful. I'm not. I'm really, really not. I just, how dare I say, like, how dare you not send that? I'm just, TikTok's a mess, man. Very, very kind of you. It's very, very, very kind of you. Thank you so much. You're all very sweet. You have kind eyes and nice hair. And, and, and I think that stops. I think you can end. All right, bye. No, guys. no, it's happening again. Oh. It's, God damn it. Stop sending things so I can end it. <laughs> so, I don't want to. We haven't had dinner, guys. I want to go. I, just, I need food. Please stop giving me money. They're giving you money so you can get food. <laughs> so, ha, stop giving me money, damn it. I need to go spend money. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's very, very kind of you guys. Genuinely, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and shut it off now. 
So even if you're sending things, it will now cease. You will no longer be allowed to send me things. So thank you so much. It's very, very kind of you. You're very, very sweet. I don't drink beer. Beer's just gross. It's like moldy bread water. It's so gross. So gross. I'm sure you all have pretty faces and nice butts, and we'll see you later. <laughs> Goodbye! <laughs>